The Library of History by Diodorus Siculus, Book 20. Published in Volume 10 of the Loeb Classical Library Edition, 1954. Translated by Russell M. Gear. Digitalized by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Start of Book 20. One might justly censure those who in their histories insert overlong orations or employ frequent speeches, for not only do they rend asunder the continuity of the narrative by the ill-timed insertion of speeches, but also they interrupt the interest of those who are eagerly pressing on toward a full knowledge of the events. Yet surely there is opportunity for those who wish to display rhetorical prowess to compose by themselves public discourses and speeches for ambassadors, likewise orations of praise and blame and the like, for by recognizing the classification of literary types and by elaborating each of the two by itself, they might reasonably expect to gain a reputation in both fields of activity. But as it is, some writers by excessive use of rhetorical passages have made the whole art of history into an appendage of oratory. Not only does that which is poorly composed give offense, but also that which seems to have hit the mark in other respects yet has gone far astray from the themes and occasions that belong to its peculiar type. Therefore, even of those who read such works, some skip over the orations although they appear to be entirely successful, and others, wearied in spirit by the historian's wordiness and lack of taste, abandon the reading entirely, and this attitude is not without reason, for the genius of history is simple and self-consistent and as a whole is like a living organism. If it is mangled, it is stripped of its living charm, but if it retains its necessary unity, it is duly preserved and, by the harmony of the whole composition, renders the reading pleasant and clear. Nevertheless, in disapproving rhetorical speeches, we do not ban them wholly from historical works, for, since history needs to be adorned with variety, in certain places it is necessary to call to our aid even such passages, and of this opportunity one should not wish to deprive myself, so that, whenever the situation requires either a public address from an ambassador or a statesman, or some such thing from the other characters, whoever does not boldly enter the contest of words would himself be blameworthy. For one would find no small number of reasons for which on many occasions the aid of rhetoric will necessarily be enlisted, for when many things have been said well and to the point, one should not in contempt pass over what is worthy of memory and possesses a utility not alien to history, nor when the subject matter is great and glorious should one allow the language to appear inferior to the deeds, and there are times when, an event turning out contrary to expectation, we shall be forced to use words suitable to the subject in order to explain the seeming paradox. But let this suffice on this subject, we must now write about the events that belong to my theme, first setting forth the chronological scheme of our narrative. In the preceding books, we have written of the deeds of both the Greeks and the barbarians from the earliest times down to the year before Agathocles' Libyan campaign, the years from the sack of Troy to that event total 883. In this book, adding what comes next in the account, we shall begin with Agathocles crossing into Libya, and end with the year in which the kings, after reaching an agreement with each other, began joint operations against Antigonus, son of Philip, embracing a period of nine years. When Hieronymus was archon in Athens, the Romans elected to the consulship Gaius Julius and Quintus Emilius, and in Sicily Agathocles, who had been defeated by the Carthaginians in the battle at the Himera's River and had lost the largest and strongest part of his army, took refuge in Syracuse. When he saw that all his allies had changed sides and that barbarians were masters of almost all Sicily except Syracuse and were far superior in both land and sea forces, he carried out an undertaking that was unexpected and most reckless. For when all had concluded that he would not even try to take the field against the Carthaginians, he determined to leave an adequate garrison for the city, to select those of the soldiers who were fit, and with these to cross over into Libya. For he hoped that, if he did this, those in Carthage, who had been living luxuriously in long-continued peace and were therefore without experience in the dangers of battle, would easily be defeated by men who had been trained in the school of danger, that the Libyan allies of the Carthaginians, who had for a long time resented their exactions, would grasp an opportunity for revolt, most important of all, that by appearing unexpectedly, he would plunder a land which had not been ravaged and which, because of the prosperity of the Carthaginians, abounded in wealth of every kind, and in general, that he would divert the barbarians from his native city and from all Sicily and transfer the whole war to Libya. And this last, indeed, was accomplished. 
Disclosing this intention to none of his friends, he set up his brother Antander as curator of the city with an adequate garrison, and he himself selected and enrolled those of the soldiers who were fit for service, bidding the infantry be ready with their arms and giving special orders to the cavalry that, in addition to their full armor, they should have with them saddle pads and bridles, in order that, when he got possession of horses, he might have men ready to mount them, equipped with what was needed for the service, for in the earlier defeat the greater part of the foot soldiers had been killed, but almost all the horsemen had survived uninjured, whose horses he was not able to transport to Libya. In order that the Syracusans might not attempt a revolution after he had left them, he separated relatives from each other, particularly brothers from brothers and fathers from sons, leaving the one group in the city and taking the others across with him, for it was clear that those who remained in Syracuse, even if they were most ill-disposed toward the tyrant, because of their affection for their relatives would do nothing unbecoming against Agathocles. Since he was in need of money he exacted the property of the orphans from those who were their guardians, saying that he would guard it much better than they and return it more faithfully to the children when they became of age, b and he also borrowed from the merchants, took some of the dedications in the temples, and stripped the women of their jewels. Then, seeing that the majority of the very wealthy were vexed by his measures and were very hostile to him, he summoned an assembly in which, deploring both the past disaster and the expected hardships, he said that he himself would endure the siege easily because he was accustomed to every manner of hardship, but that he pitied the citizens if they should be shut in and forced to endure a siege. He therefore ordered those to save themselves and their own possessions who were unwilling to endure whatever fortune might see fit that they should suffer. But when those who were wealthiest and most bitter against the tyrant had set out from the city, sending after them some of his mercenaries, he killed the men themselves and confiscated their property. When, through a single unholy act, he had gained an abundance of wealth and had cleared the city of those who were opposed to him, he freed those of their slaves who were fit for military service. When everything was ready, Agathocles manned sixty ships and awaited a suitable time for the voyage. Since his purpose was unknown, some supposed that he was making an expedition into Italy, and others that he was going to plunder the part of Sicily that was under Carthaginian control, but all despaired of the safety of those who were about to sail away and condemned the prince for his mad folly. But since the enemy was blockading the port with triremes many times more numerous than his own, Agathocles at first for some days was compelled to detain his soldiers in the ships since they could not sail out, but later, when some grain ships were putting into the city, the Carthaginians with their whole fleet made for these ships, and Agathocles, who already despaired of his enterprise, as he saw the mouth of the harbour freed of the blockading ships, sailed out, his men rowing at top. Speed then when the Carthaginians, who were already close to the cargo vessels, saw the enemy sailing with their ships in close order, assuming at first that Agathocles was hastening to the rescue of the grain ships, they turned and made their fleet ready for battle, but when he saw the ships sailing straight past and getting a long start of them, they began to pursue. Thereupon, while these were contending with each other, the ships that were bringing grain, unexpectedly escaping the danger, brought about a great abundance of provisions in Syracuse, when a scarcity of food was already gripping the city, and Agathocles, who was already at the point of being overtaken and surrounded, gained unhoped for safety as night closed in. On the next day there occurred such an eclipse of the sun that utter darkness set in and the stars were seen everywhere, wherefore Agathocles men, believing that the prodigy portended misfortune for them, fell into even greater anxiety about the future. After they had sailed for six days and the same number of nights, just as day was breaking, the fleet of the Carthaginians was unexpectedly seen not far away. At this both fleets were filled with zeal and vied with each other in rowing, the Carthaginians believing that as soon as they destroyed the Greek ships they would have Syracuse in their hands and at the same time free their fatherland from great dangers, and the Greeks foreseeing that, if they did not get to land first, punishment was in store for themselves and the perils of slavery for those who had been left at home. When Libya came into sight, the men on board began to cheer and the rivalry became very keen, the ships of the barbarians sailed faster since their crews had undergone very long training, but those of the Greeks had sufficient lead. The distance was covered very quickly, and when the ships drew near the land they rushed side by side for the beach like men in a race, indeed, since they were within range, the first of the Carthaginian ships were sending missiles at the last of those of Agathocles. Consequently, when they had fought for a short time with bows and slings and the barbarians had come to close quarters with a few of the Greek ships, Agathocles got the upper hand since he had his complement of soldiers. At this the Carthaginians withdrew and lay offshore a little beyond bowshot, but Agathocles, having disembarked his soldiers at the place called Latomi and constructed a palisade from sea to sea, beached his ships. 
when he had thus carried through a perilous enterprise, Agathocles ventured upon another even more hazardous. For after surrounding himself with those among the leaders who were ready to follow his proposal, and after making sacrifice to Demeter and Kor, he summoned an assembly, next he came forward to speak, crowned and clad in a splendid himation, and when he had made prefatory remarks of a nature appropriate to the undertaking, he declared that to Demeter and Kor, the goddesses who protected Sicily, he had at the very moment when they were pursued by the Carthaginians vowed to offer all the ships. As a burnt offering. Therefore it was well, since they had succeeded in gaining safety, that they should pay the vow. In place of these ships he promised to restore many times the number if they would but fight boldly, and in truth, he added, the goddesses by omens from the victims had foretold victory in the entire war. While he was saying this, one of his attendants brought forward a lighted torch. When he had taken this and had given orders to distribute torches likewise to all the ship captains, he invoked the goddesses and himself first set out to the trireme of the commander. Standing by the stern, he bade the others also to follow his example. Then as all the captains threw in the fire and the flames quickly blazed high, the trumpeters sounded the signal for battle and the army raised the war cry, while all together prayed for a safe return home. This Agathocles did primarily to compel his soldiers in the midst of dangers to have no thought at all of flight, for it was clear that, if the retreat to the ships was cut off, in victory alone would they have hope of safety. Moreover, since he had a small army, he reasoned that if he guarded the ships he would be compelled to divide his forces, and so be by no means strong enough to meet the enemy in battle, and if he left the ships without defenders, he would put them into the hands of the Carthaginians. Nevertheless, when all the ships were aflame and the fire was spreading widely, terror laid hold upon the Sicilians. Carried away at first by the wiles of Agathocles and by the rapidity of his undertakings, which gave no time for reflection, all acquiesced in what was being done, but when time made possible detailed consideration, they were plunged into regret, and as they considered the vastness of the sea that separated them from home, they abandoned hope of safety. Agathocles, however, in an effort to rid his soldiers of their despondency, led his army against the place called Megalopolis, a city of the Carthaginians. The intervening country through which it was necessary for them to march was divided into gardens and plantations of every kind, since many streams of water were led in small channels and irrigated every part. There were also country houses one after another, constructed in luxurious fashion and covered with stucco, which gave evidence of the wealth of the people who possessed them. The farm buildings were filled with everything that was needful for enjoyment, seeing that the inhabitants in a long period of peace had stored up an abundant variety of products. Part of the land was planted with vines, and part yielded olives and was also planted thickly with other varieties of fruit-bearing trees. On each side herds of cattle and flocks of sheep pastured on the plain, and the neighboring meadows were filled with grazing horses. In general there was a manifold prosperity in the region, since the leading Carthaginians had laid out there their private estates and with their wealth had beautified them for their enjoyment. Therefore the Sicilians, amazed at the beauty of the land and at its prosperity, were buoyed up by expectation, for they beheld prizes commensurate with their dangers ready at hand for the victors, and Agathocles, seeing that the soldiers were recovering from their discouragement and had become eager for battle, attacked the city walls by direct assault. Since the onset was unforeseen and the inhabitants, because they did not know what was happening and because they had no experience in the wars, resisted only a short time, he took the city by storm, and giving it over to his soldiers for pillage, he at a single stroke loaded his army with booty and filled it with confidence. Then, setting out immediately for White Tunis, as it is called, he subdued this city, which lies about two thousand stades from Carthage. The soldiers wished to garrison both of the captured cities and deposit the booty in them, but Agathocles, meditating actions conforming to those that had already been accomplished and telling the crowd that it was advantageous to leave behind them no places of refuge until they should have been victorious in battle, destroyed the cities and camped in the open. When the Carthaginians who lay at anchor off the station where the Sicilian fleet was beached saw the ships burning, they were delighted, thinking that it was through fear of themselves that the enemy had been forced to destroy his ships, but when they saw that the army of their opponents was moving into the country, as they reckoned up the consequences, they concluded that the destruction of the fleet was their own misfortune. Therefore they spread hides over the prows of their ships as they were in the habit of doing whenever it seemed that any public misfortune had befallen the city of Carthage, and, after taking the bronze beaks of the ships of Agathocles on board their own triremes, they sent to Carthage messengers to report exactly what had happened. 
But before these had explained the situation, the country folk who had seen the landing of Agathocles reported it quickly to the Carthaginians. Panic-stricken at the unexpected event, they supposed that their own forces in Sicily, both army and navy, had been destroyed, for Agathocles, they believed, would never have ventured to leave Syracuse stripped of defenders unless he had been victorious, seen nor to transport an army across the straits while the enemy controlled the sea. Therefore panic and great confusion seized upon the city, the crowds rushed to the marketplace, and the council of elders consulted what should be done. In fact there was no army at hand that could take the field against the enemy, the mass of the citizens, who had had no experience in warfare, were already in despair, and the enemy was thought to be near the walls. Accordingly, some proposed to send envoys to Agathocles to sue for peace, these same men serving also as spies to observe the situation of the enemy, but some urged that they should delay until they had learned precisely what had taken place. However, while such confusion prevailed in the city, the messengers sent by the commander of the fleet sailed in and made clear the true explanation of what had happened. Now that all had regained their courage, the council reprimanded all the commanders of the fleet because, although controlling the sea, they had allowed a hostile army to set foot on Libya, and had appointed as generals of the armies Hanno and Bormilcar, men who had an inherited feud. The councillors thought, indeed, that because of the private mistrust and enmity of the generals the safety of the city as a whole would be secured, but they completely missed the truth. For Bormilcar, who had long had his heart set on tyranny but had lacked authority and a proper occasion for his attempt, now gained an excellent starting point by getting the command as general. The basic cause in this matter was the Carthaginian's severity in inflicting punishments. In their wars, they advanced their leading men to commands, taking it for granted that these should be first to brave danger for the whole state, but when they gain peace, they plague these same men with suits, bring false charges against them through envy, and load them down with penalties. Therefore some of those who are placed in positions of command, fearing the trials in the courts, desert their posts, but others attempt to become tyrants, and this is what Bormilcar, one of the two generals, did on this occasion, about him we shall speak a little later. But to resume, the generals of the Carthaginians, seeing that the situation was not at all consistent with delay, did not await soldiers from the country and from the allied cities, but they led the citizen soldiers themselves into the field, in number not less than 40,000 foot soldiers, 1,000 horsemen, and 2,000 chariots. Occupying a slight elevation not far from the enemy, they drew up their army for battle. Hanno had command of the right wing, those enrolled in the sacred band fighting beside him, and Bormilcar, commanding the left, made his phalanx deep since the terrain prevented him from extending it on a broader front. The chariots and the cavalry they stationed in front of the phalanx, having determined to strike with these first and test the temper of the Greeks. After Agathocles had viewed the array of the barbarians, he entrusted the right wing to his son Archagathus, giving him 2,500 foot soldiers, and he drew up the Syracusans, who were 3,500 in number, then 3,000 Greek mercenaries, and finally 3,000 Samnites, Etruscans, and Celts. He himself with his bodyguard fought in front of the left wing, opposing with 1,000 hoplites the sacred band of the Carthaginians. The 500 archers and slingers he divided between the wings. There was hardly enough equipment for the soldiers, and when he saw the men of the crews unarmed he had the shield covers stretched with sticks, thus making them similar in appearance to the round shields, and distributed them to these men, of no use at all for real service, but when seen from a distance capable of creating the impression of arms in the minds of men who did not know the truth. Seeing that his soldiers were frightened by the great numbers of barbarian cavalry and infantry, he let loose into the army in many places owls, which he had long since prepared as a means of relieving the discouragement of the common soldiers. The owls, flying through the phalanx and settling on the shields and helmets, encouraged the soldiers, each man regarding this as an omen because the bird is held sacred to Athena. Such things as this, although they might seem to some an inane device, have often been responsible for great successes. And so it happened on this occasion also, for when courage inspired the common soldiers and word was passed along that the deity was clearly foretelling victory for them, they awaited the battle with greater steadfastness. Indeed, when the chariots charged against them, they shot down some and allowed others to pass through, but most of them they forced to turn back against the line of their own infantry. In the same way they withstood also the charge of the cavalry, and by bringing down many of them, they made them flee to the rear. While they were distinguishing themselves in these preliminary contests, the infantry force of the barbarians had all come to close quarters. 
A gallant battle developed, and Hanno, who had fighting under him the sacred band of selected men and was intent upon gaining the victory by himself, pressed heavily upon the Greeks and slew many of them. Even when all kinds of missiles were hurled against him, he would not yield but pushed on those suffering many wounds until he died from exhaustion. When he had fallen, the Carthaginians who were drawn up in that part of the line were disheartened, but Agathocles and his men were elated and became much bolder than before. When Bormilcar, the other general, heard of this from certain persons, thinking the gods had given him the opportunity for gaining a position from which to make a bid for the tyranny, he reasoned thus with himself, if the army of Agathocles should be destroyed, he himself would not be able to make his attempt at supremacy since the citizens would be strong. But if the former should win the victory and quench the pride of the Carthaginians, the already defeated people would be easy for him to manage, and he could defeat Agathocles readily whenever he wished. When he had reached this conclusion, he withdrew with the men of the front rank, presenting to the enemy an inexplicable retirement, but making known to his own men the death of Hanno and ordering them to withdraw in formation to the high ground, for this, he said, was to their advantage. But as the enemy pressed on and the whole retreat was becoming like a rout, the Libyans of the next ranks, believing that the front rank was being defeated by sheer force, broke into flight. Those, however, who were leading the sacred band after the death of its general Hanno, at first resisted stoutly and, stepping over the bodies of their own men as they fell, withstood every danger. But when they perceived that the greater part of the army had turned to flight and that the enemy was surrounding them in the rear, they were forced to withdraw. And so, when rot spread throughout the entire army of the Carthaginians, the barbarians kept fleeing towards Carthage, but Agathocles, after pursuing them to a certain point, turned back and plundered the camp of the enemy. There fell in this battle Greeks to the number of two hundred, and of Carthaginians not more than a thousand, but as some have written, upwards of six thousand. In the camp of the Carthaginians were found, along with other goods, many wagons, in which were being transported more than twenty thousand pairs of manacles, for the Carthaginians, having expected to master the Greeks easily, had passed the word along among themselves to take alive as many as possible and, after shackling them, to throw them into slave pens. But, I think, the divinity of set purpose in the case of men who are arrogant in their calculations changes the outcome of their confident expectations into its contrary. Now Agathocles, having surprisingly defeated the Carthaginians, was holding them shut up within their walls, but fortune, alternating victories with defeats, humbled the victors equally with the vanquished. For in Sicily the Carthaginians, who had defeated Agathocles in a great battle, were besieging Syracuse, but in Libya Agathocles, having gained the upper hand in a battle of such importance, had brought the Carthaginians under siege, and what was most amazing, on the island the tyrant, though his armaments were unscathed, had proved inferior to the barbarians, but on the continent, with a portion of his once defeated army he got the better of those who had been victorious. Therefore the Carthaginians, believing that the misfortune had come to them from the gods, betook themselves to every manner of supplication of the divine powers, and, because they believed that Heracles, who was worshipped in their mother city, was exceedingly angry with them, they sent a large sum of money and many of the most expensive offerings to Tyre. Since they had come as colonists from that city, it had been their custom in the earlier period to send to the god a tenth of all that was paid into the public revenue, but later, when they had acquired great wealth and were receiving more considerable revenues, they sent very little indeed, holding the divinity of little account. But turning to repentance because of this misfortune, they bethought them of all the gods of Tyre. They even sent from their temples in supplication the golden shrines with their images, believing that they would better appease the wrath of the god if the offerings were sent for the sake of winning forgiveness. They also alleged that Cronus had turned against them inasmuch as in former times they had been accustomed to sacrifice to this god the noblest of their sons, but more recently, secretly buying and nurturing children, they had sent these to the sacrifice, and when an investigation was made, some of those who had been sacrificed were discovered to have been supposititious. When they had given thought to these things and saw their enemy encamped before their walls, they were filled with superstitious dread, for they believed that they had neglected the honors of the gods that had been established by their fathers. In their zeal to make amends for their omission, they selected two hundred of the noblest children and sacrificed them publicly, and others who were under suspicion sacrificed themselves voluntarily, in number not less than three hundred. There was in their city a bronze image of Cronus, extending its hands, palms up and sloping toward the ground, so that each of the children when placed thereon rolled down and fell into a sort of gaping pit filled with fire. 
It is probable that it was from this that Euripides has drawn the mythical story found in his works about the sacrifice in Taurus, in which he presents Iphigenia being asked by Orestes. But what tomb shall receive me when I die? A sacred fire within, and earth's broad rift. Also, the story passed down among the Greeks from ancient myth that Cronus did away with his own children appears to have been kept in mind among the Carthaginians through this observance. However this may be, after such a reversal in Libya, the Carthaginians sent messengers into Sicily to Hamilcar, begging him to send aid as soon as possible, and they dispatched to him the captured bronze beaks of Agathocles' ships. Hamilcar ordered those who had sailed across to keep silent about the defeat that had been sustained, but to spread abroad to the soldiers' word that Agathocles had utterly lost his fleet and his whole army. Hamilcar himself, dispatching into Syracuse as envoys some of those who had come from Carthage and sending with them the beaks, demanded the surrender of the city, for, he said, the army of the Syracusans had been cut to pieces by the Carthaginians and their ships had been burned, and the production of the beaks offered proof to those who disbelieved. When the inhabitants of the city heard the reported misfortune of Agathocles, the common people believed, the magistrates, however, being in doubt, watched closely that there might be no disorder, but they sent the envoys away at once, and the relatives and friends of the exiles and any others who were displeased with the actions of the magistrates they cast out of the city, in number not less than eight thousand. Thereupon, when so great a multitude was suddenly forced to leave its native place, the city was filled with running to and fro and with uproar and the lamentation of women, for there was no household that did not have its share of mourning at that time. Those who were of the party of the tyrant lamented at the misfortune of Agathocles and his sons, and some of the private citizens wept for the men believed to have been lost in Libya, and others for those who were being driven from hearth and ancestral gods, who could neither remain nor yet go outside the walls since the barbarians were besieging the city, and who, in addition to the aforesaid evils, which were great enough, were being compelled to drag along with them in their flight infant. Children and Women but when the exiles took refuge with Hamilcar, he offered them safety, and, making ready his army, he led it against Syracuse, expecting to take the city both because it was bereft of defenders and because of the disaster that had been reported to those who had been left there. After Hamilcar had sent an embassy in advance and had offered safety to Antander and those with him if they surrendered the city, those of the leaders who were held in highest esteem came together in council. After prolonged discussion and tender thought it necessary to surrender the city, since he was unmanly by nature and of a disposition the direct opposite of the boldness and energy of his brother, but Arimnon the Aetolian, who had been set up by Agathocles as co-ruler with his brother, expressing the contrary opinion persuaded all of them to hold out until they should hear the truth. When Hamilcar learned the decision of those in the city, he constructed engines of all kinds, having determined to attack. But Agathocles, who had built two thirty-oared ships after the battle, sent one of them to Syracuse, placing on board his strongest oarsman and Nearchus, one of his trusted friends, who was to report the victory to his own people. Having had a fair voyage, they approached Syracuse during the night of the fifth day, and wearing wreaths and singing paeans as they sailed they reached the city at daybreak. But the picket ships of the Carthaginians caught sight of them and pursued them vigorously, and since the pursuit had no great start, there arose a contest in rowing. While they were vying with each other, the folk of the city and the besiegers, seeing what was happening, both ran to the port, and each group, sharing in the anxiety of its own men, encouraged them with shouts. When the dispatch boat was already at the point of being taken, the barbarians raised a shout of triumph, and the inhabitants of the city, since they could give no aid, prayed the gods for the safety of those who were sailing in. But when, not far from the shore, the ram of one of the pursuers was already bearing down to deliver its blow, the pursued ship succeeded in getting inside of the range of missiles and, the Syracusans having come to its aid, escaped from the danger. But when Hamilcar saw that the inhabitants of the city, because of their anxiety and because of the surprising nature of the message they now anticipated, had run together to the port, surmising that some portion of the wall was unguarded, he advanced his strongest soldiers with scaling ladders. These, finding that the guard posts had been abandoned, ascended without being discovered, but, when they had almost taken the wall between two towers, the guard, making its rounds according to custom, discovered them. In the fighting that ensued the men of the city ran together and arrived in advance of those who were coming to reinforce the men who had scaled the wall, of whom they killed some and hurled others down from the battlements. Hamilcar, greatly distressed at this, withdrew his army from the city and sent to those in Carthage a relief expedition of five thousand men. 
Meanwhile Agathocles, who had control of the open country, was taking the strongholds about Carthage by storm, and he prevailed on some of the cities to come over to him because of fear, others because of their hatred for the Carthaginians. After fortifying a camp near Tunis and leaving there an adequate garrison, he moved against the cities situated along the sea. Taking by storm the first, Nepolis, he treated the captured people humanely, then, marching against Hadramedum, he began a siege of that city, but received Elimas, the king of the Libyans, into alliance. On hearing of these moves the Carthaginians brought their entire army against Tunis and captured the encampment of Agathocles, then, after bringing siege engines up to the city, they made unremitting attacks. But Agathocles, when some had reported to him the reverses suffered by his men, left the larger part of his army for the siege, but with his retinue and a few of the soldiers went secretly to a place in the mountains whence he could be seen both by the people of Hadramedum and by the Carthaginians who were besieging Tunis. By instructing his soldiers to light fires at night over a great area, he caused the Carthaginians to believe that he was coming against them with a large army, while the besieged thought that another strong force was at hand as an ally for their enemy. Both of them, deceived by the deceptive stratagem, suffered an unexpected defeat, those who were besieging Tunis fled to Carthage abandoning their siege engines, and the people of Hadramedum surrendered their homeland because of their fright. After receiving the city on terms, Agathocles took Thapsus by force, and of the other cities of the region some he took by storm and some he won by persuasion. When he had gained control of all the cities, which were more than two hundred in number, he had in mind to lead his army into the inland regions of Libya. After Agathocles had set out and had marched for a good many days, the Carthaginians, advancing with the force that had been brought across from Sicily and their other army, again undertook the siege of Tunis, and they recaptured many of the positions that were in the hands of the enemy. But Agathocles, since dispatch-bearers had come to him from Tunis and disclosed what the Phoenicians had done, at once turned back. When he was at a distance of about two hundred stades from the enemy, he pitched camp and forbade his soldiers to light fires. Then, making a night march, he fell at dawn upon those who were foraging in the country and those who were wandering outside their camp in disorder, and by killing over two thousand and taking captive no small number he greatly strengthened himself for the future. For the Carthaginians, now that their reinforcements from Sicily had arrived and that their Libyan allies were fighting along with them, seemed to be superior to Agathocles, but as soon as he gained the success, the confidence of the barbarians again waned. In fact, he defeated in battle Elimas, the king of the Libyans, who had deserted him, and slew the king and many of the barbarians. This was the situation of affairs in Sicily and Libya did I and Macedonia, Cassander, going to the aid of Audolian, king of the Paeonians, who was fighting against the Autariati, freed the king from danger, but the Autariati with the children and women who were following them, numbering in all twenty thousand, he settled beside the mountain called Orbelis. While he was thus engaged, in the Peloponnesus Ptolemaeus, the general of Antigonus, who had been entrusted with an army but had taken offense at the prince because, as he said, he was not being honored according to his deserts, revolted from Antigonus and made an alliance with Cassander. And having left as governor of the satrapy along the Hellespont one of his most faithful friends, Phoenix, Ptolemaeus sent soldiers to him, bidding him garrison the strongholds in the cities and not to obey Antigonus. Since the agreements common to the leaders provided for the liberation of the Greek cities, Ptolemy, the ruler of Egypt, charged Antigonus with having occupied some of the cities with garrisons and prepared to go to war. Sending his army and Leonides as its commander, Ptolemy subdued the cities in Cilicia Trachea which were subject to Antigonus, and he sent also to the cities that were controlled by Cassander and Lysimachus, asking them to cooperate with him and prevent Antigonus from becoming too powerful. But Antigonus sent Philip, the younger of his sons, to the Hellespont to fight it out with Phoenix and the rebels, and to Cilicia he sent Demetrius, who, carrying on the campaign with vigor, defeated the generals of Ptolemy and recovered the cities. Meanwhile Polyperchon, who was biding his time in the Peloponnesus, and who was nursing grievances against Cassander and had long craved the leadership of the Macedonians, summoned from Pergamon Barcina's son Heracles, who was the son of Alexander but was being reared in Pergamon, being about seventeen years of age. Moreover, Polyperchon, sending to his own friends in many places and to those who were at odds with Cassander, kept urging them to restore the youth to his ancestral throne. He also wrote to the Federal League of the Aetolians, begging them to grant a safe conduct and to join forces with him and promising to repay the favor many times over if they would aid in placing the youth on his ancestral throne. 
Since the affair proceeded as he wished, the Aetolians being in hearty agreement and many others hurrying to aid in the restoration of the king, in all there were assembled more than twenty thousand infantry and at least one thousand horsemen. Meanwhile, Polly Perkin, intent on the preparations for the war, was gathering money and sending to those to Macedonians who were friendly, he kept urging them to join in the undertaking. Ptolemy, however, who was master of the cities of Cyprus, on learning from certain persons that Nicocles, the king of Paphos, had secretly and privately formed an alliance with Antigonus, dispatched two of his friends, Argeus and Callicrates, ordering them to slay Nicocles, for he was taking all precautions lest any others also should hasten to shift allegiance when they saw that those were left unpunished who had previously rebelled. These two men, accordingly, after sailing to the island and obtaining soldiers from Menelaus the general, surrounded the house of Nicocles, informed him of the king's wishes and ordered him to take his own life. At first, he tried to defend himself against the charges, but then, since no one heeded him, he slew himself. Axiothea, the wife of Nicocles, on learning of her husband's death, slew her daughters, who were unwed, in order that no enemy might possess them, and she urged the wives of Nicocles' brothers to choose death along with her, although Ptolemy had given no instructions in regard to the women but had agreed to their safety. When the palace had thus been filled full of death and unforeseen disaster, the brothers of Nicocles, after fastening the doors, set fire to the building and slew themselves. Thus the house of the kings of Paphos, after meeting such tragic suffering, was brought to its end in the way described. Now that we have followed to its end the tale of what took place in Cyprus, we shall turn the course of our narrative toward the events which follow. At about the same time in the region of the Pontus, after the death of Parasades, who was king of the Sumerian Bosporus, his sons Eumelus, Satyrus, and Pritanes were engaged in a struggle against each other for the primacy. Of these, Satyrus, since he was the eldest, had received the government from his father, who had been king for thirty-eight years, but Eumelus, after concluding a treaty of friendship with some of the barbarians who lived nearby and collecting a strong army, set up a rival claim to the throne. On learning this, Satyrus set out against him with a strong army, and, after he had crossed the river Thates and drawn near the enemy, he surrounded his camp with the wagons in which he carried his abundant supplies, and drew up his army for battle, taking his own place in the center of the phalanx as is the Scythian custom. Enrolled in his army were not more than two thousand Greek mercenaries and an equal number of Thracians, but all the rest were Scythian allies, more than twenty thousand foot soldiers and not less than ten thousand horse. Eumelus, however, had his ally Aerophorns, the king of the Cerases, with 20,000 horse and 22,000 foot. In a stubborn battle that took place, Satyrus with picked cavalry about him charged against Aerophorns, who had stationed himself in the middle of the line, and after many had fallen on both sides, he finally forced back and routed the king of the barbarians. At first he pushed on, slaying the enemy as he overtook them, but after a little, hearing that his brother Eumelus was gaining the upper hand on the right wing and that his own mercenaries had been turned to flight, he gave up the pursuit. Going to the aid of those who had been worsted and for the second time becoming the author of victory, he routed the entire army of the enemy so that it became clear to all that, by reason both of his birth and of his valor, it was proper that he should succeed to the throne of his fathers. Aerophorns and Eumelus, however, after having been defeated in the battle, escaped to the capital city. This was situated on the Thates River, which made the city rather difficult of access since the river encircled it and was of considerable depth. The city was surrounded also by great cliffs and thick woods, and had only two entrances, both artificial, of which one was within the royal castle itself and was strengthened with high towers and outworks, and the other was on the opposite side in swampy land, fortified by wooden palisades, and it rested upon piles at intervals and supported houses above the water. Since the strength of the position was so great, Satyrus at first plundered the country of the enemy and fired the villages, from which he collected prisoners and much booty. Afterwards, however, he attempted to make his way by force through the approaches. At the outworks and towers he lost many of his soldiers and withdrew, but he forced a passage through the swamp and captured the wooden barricades. After destroying these and crossing the river, he began to cut down the woods through which it was necessary to advance to reach the palace. While this was being energetically carried on, King Aerophorns, alarmed lest his citadel should be taken by storm, fought against him with great boldness since he believed that in victory alone lay hope of safety. 
he stationed archers on both sides of the passage, by whose aid he easily inflicted mortal wounds on the men who were cutting down the woods, for because of the density of the trees they could neither see the missiles in time nor strike back at the archers. The men of Satyrus for three days went on cutting down the woods and making a roadway, bearing up amid hardship, on the fourth day they drew near to the wall, but they were overcome by the great number of missiles and by the confined space, and sustained great losses. Indeed, Meniscus, the leader of the mercenaries, a man excelling in sagacity and boldness, after pushing forward through the passage to the wall and fighting brilliantly together with his men, was forced to withdraw when a much stronger force came out against him. Seeing him in danger, Satyrus quickly came to his aid, but, while withstanding the onrush of the enemy, he was wounded with a spear through the upper arm. Grievously disabled because of the wound, he returned to the camp and when night came on he died, having reigned only nine months after the death of his father Parasades. But Meniscus, the leader of the mercenaries, giving up the siege, led the army back to the city Gargaza, whence he conveyed the king's body by way of the river to Panticopium to his brother, Pritanes. Pritanes, after celebrating a magnificent funeral and placing the body in the royal tombs, came quickly to Gargaza and took over both the army and the royal power. When Eumelus sent envoys to discuss a partition of the kingdom, he did not heed him, but he left a garrison in Gargaza and returned to Panticopium in order to secure the royal prerogatives for himself. During this time, Eumelus with the cooperation of the barbarians captured Gargaza and several of the other cities and villages. When Pritanes took the field against him, Eumelus defeated his brother in battle, and, after shutting him up in the isthmus near the Meotic Lake, he forced him to accept terms according to which he gave over his army and agreed to vacate his place as king. However, when Pritanes entered Panticopium, which had always been the capital of those who had ruled in Bosporus, he tried to recover his kingdom, but he was overpowered and fled to the so-called gardens, where he was slain. After his brother's death Eumelus, wishing to establish his power securely, slew the friends of Satyrus and Pritanes, and likewise their wives and children. The only one to escape him was Parasades, the son of Satyrus, who was very young, he, riding out of the city on horseback, took refuge with Agoras, the king of the Scythians. Since the citizens were angry at the slaughter of their kinsmen, Eumelus summoned the people to an assembly in which he defended himself in this matter and restored the constitution of their fathers. He even granted to them the immunity from taxation that those who lived in Panticopium had enjoyed under his ancestors. He promised also to free all of them from special levies, and he discussed many other measures as he sought the favor of the people. When all had been promptly restored to their former goodwill by his benevolence, from that time on he continued to be king, ruling in a constitutional way over his subjects and by his excellence winning no little admiration. For Eumelus continued to show kindness to the people of Byzantium and to those of Sinope and to most of the other Greeks who lived on the Pontus, and when the people of Calantia were besieged by Lysimachus and were hard-pressed by lack of food, he took under his care a thousand who had left their homes because of the famine. Not only did he grant them a safe place of refuge, but he gave them a city in which to live and allotted to them the region called Soancaetus. In the interests of those who sailed on the Pontus he waged war against the barbarians who were accustomed to engage in piracy, the Heniochians, the Taurians, and the Achaeans, and he cleared the sea of pirates, with the result that, not only throughout his own kingdom but even throughout almost all the inhabited world, since the merchants carried abroad the news of his nobility, he received that highest reward of well-doing, praise. He also gained possession of much of the adjacent region inhabited by the barbarians and made his kingdom far more famous. In sum, he undertook to subdue all the nations around the Pontus, and possibly he would have accomplished his purpose if his life had not been suddenly cut off. For, after he had been king for five years and an equal number of months, he died, suffering a very strange mishap. As he was returning home from Sindus and was hurrying for a sacrifice, riding to his palace in a four-horse carriage which had four wheels and a canopy, it happened that the horses were frightened and ran away with him. Since the driver was unable to manage the reins, the king, fearing lest he be carried to the ravines, tried to jump out, but his sword caught in the wheel, and he was dragged along by the motion of the carriage and died on the spot. About the death of the brothers, Eumelus and Satyrus, prophecies have been handed down, rather silly yet accepted among the people of the land. They say that the god had told Satyrus to be on his guard against the mouse lest at some time cause his death. 
For this reason he permitted neither slave nor freeman of those assigned to his service to have this name, and he also feared domestic and field mice and was always ordering his slaves to kill them and block up their holes. But, although he did everything possible by which he thought to ward off his doom, he died, struck in the upper arm through the mouse. In the case of Eumelus, the warning was that he should be on guard against the house that is on the move. Therefore, he never afterward entered a house freely unless his servants had previously examined the roof and the foundations. But when he died because of the canopy that was carried on the four-horse chariot, all agreed that the prophecy had been fulfilled. Concerning the events that took place in the Bosporus, let this suffice us. In Italy, the Roman consuls with an army invaded the hostile territory and defeated the Samnites in battle at the place called Talium. When the defeated had occupied the place named the Holy Mount, the Romans for the moment withdrew to their own camp since night was coming on, but on the next day a second battle was waged in which many of the Samnites were killed and more than 2200 were taken prisoners. After such successes had been won by the Romans, it came to pass that their consuls from then on dominated the open country with impunity and overcame the cities which did not submit. Taking Cataracta and Saronilia by siege, they imposed garrisons upon them, but some of the other cities they won over by persuasion. When Demetrius of Phalerum was archon in Athens, in Rome Quintus Fabius received the consulship for the second time and Gaius Martius for the first. While these were in office, Ptolemy, the king of Egypt, hearing that his own generals had lost the cities of Cilicia, sailed with an army to Phaselis and took the city. Then, crossing into Lycia, he took by storm Xanthus, which was garrisoned by Antigonus. Next he sailed to Conus and won the city, and violently attacking the citadels, which were held by garrisons, he stormed the Heracleum, but he gained possession of the Persicum when its soldiers delivered it to him. Thereafter he sailed to Cos and sent for Ptolemaeus, who, although he was the nephew of Antigonus and had been entrusted by him with an army, had deserted his uncle and was offering cooperation to Ptolemy. When Ptolemaeus had sailed from Chalcis and had come to Cos, Ptolemy at first received him graciously, then, on discovering that he had become presumptuous and was trying to win over the leaders to himself by conversing with them and giving them gifts, fearing lest he should devise some plot, he forestalled this by arresting him and compelled him to drink hemlock. As for the soldiers who had followed Ptolemaeus, after Ptolemy had won their favor through promises, he distributed them among the men of his own army. Meanwhile, Polyperchon, who had collected a strong army, brought back to his father's kingdom Heracles, the son of Alexander and Barsine, but when he was in camp at the place called Stymphium, Cassander arrived with his army. As the camps were not far distant from each other and the Macedonians regarded the restoration of the king without disfavor, Cassander, since he feared lest the Macedonians, being by nature prone to change sides easily, should sometime desert to Heracles, sent an embassy to Polyperchon. As for the king, Cassander tried to show Polyperchon that if the restoration should take place he would do what was ordered by others, but, he said, if Polyperchon joined with him and slew the stripling, he would at once recover what had formerly been granted him throughout Macedonia, and then, after receiving an army, he would be appointed general in the Peloponnesus and would be partner in everything in Cassander's realm, being honored above all. Finally he won Polyperchon over by many great promises, made a secret compact with him, and induced him to murder the king. When Polyperchon had slain the youth and was openly cooperating with Cassander, he recovered the grants in Macedonia and also, according to the agreement, received 4,000 Macedonian foot soldiers and 500 Thessalian horse. Enrolling also those of the others who wished, he attempted to lead them through Boeotia into the Peloponnesus, but, when he was prevented by Boeotians and Peloponnesians, he turned aside, advanced into Locris, and there passed the winter. While these events were taking place, Lysimachus founded a city in the Chersonesus, calling it Lysimachia after himself. Cleomenes, the king of the Lacedaemonians, died after having ruled sixty years and ten months, and Arius, grandson of Cleomenes and son of Acritatus, succeeded to the throne and ruled for forty-four years. At about this time Hamilcar, the general of the armies in Sicily, after gaining possession of the remaining outposts, advanced with his army against Syracuse, intending to take that city also by storm. He prevented the importation of grain since he had controlled the sea for a long time, and after destroying the crops on the land he now undertook to capture the region about the Olympium, which lies before the city. Immediately on his arrival, however, he also decided to attack the walls, since the soothsayer had said to him at the inspection of the victims that on the next day he would certainly dine in Syracuse. 
But the people of the city, learning the intention of their enemy, sent out at night about three thousand of their infantry and about four hundred of their cavalry, ordering them to occupy Euryelis. These quickly carried out the orders, but the Carthaginians advanced during the night, believing that they would not be seen by the enemy. Now Hamilcar was in the foremost place with those who were regularly arrayed about him, and he was followed by Deinocrates, who had received command of the cavalry. The main body of the foot soldiers was divided into two phalanxes, one composed of the barbarians and one of the Greek allies. Outside the ranks a mixed crowd of rabble also followed along for the sake of booty, men who are of no use whatever to an army, but are the source of tumult and irrational confusion, from which the most extreme dangers often arise. And on this occasion, since the roads were narrow and rough, the baggage train and some of the camp followers kept jostling each other as they competed for the right of way, and, since the crowd was pressed into a narrow space and for this reason some became involved in brawls and many tried to help each side, great confusion and tumult prevailed in the army. At this point the Syracusans who had occupied Euryelis, perceiving that the enemy were advancing in confusion whereas they themselves occupied higher positions, charged upon their opponents. Some of them stood on the heights and sent missiles at those who were coming up, some by occupying advantageous positions forced the fleeing soldiers to cast themselves down the cliffs, for on account of the darkness and the lack of information the enemy supposed that the Syracusans had arrived with a large force for the attack. The Carthaginians, being at a disadvantage partly because of the confusion in their own ranks and partly because of the sudden appearance of the enemy, and in particular at a loss because of their ignorance of the locality and their cramped position, were driven into flight. But since there was no broad passage through the place, some of them were trodden down by their own horsemen, who were numerous, and others fought among themselves as if enemies, ignorance prevailing because of the darkness. Hamilcar at first withstood the enemy stoutly and exhorted those drawn up near him to join with him in the fighting, but afterwards the soldiers abandoned him on account of the confusion and panic, and he, left alone, was pounced upon by the Syracusans. One might with reason note the inconsistency of fortune and the strange manner in which human events turn out contrary to expectation. For Agathocles, who was outstanding in courage and who had had a large army fighting in his support, not only was defeated decisively by the barbarians at the Himera's river, but he even lost the strongest and largest part of his army, whereas the garrison troops left behind in Syracuse, with only a small part of those who had previously been defeated, not only got the better of the Carthaginian army that had besieged them, but even captured alive Hamilcar, the most famous of their citizens. And what was most amazing, 120,000 foot soldiers and 5,000 horsemen were defeated in battle by a small number of the enemy who enlisted deception and terrain on their side, so that the saying is true that many are the empty alarms of war. After the rout the Carthaginians, scattered some here some there, were with difficulty gathered on the next day, and the Syracusans, returning to the city with much plunder, delivered Hamilcar over to those who wished to take vengeance upon him. They recalled also the word of the soothsayer who had said that Hamilcar would enter Syracuse and dine there on the next day, the divinity having presented the truth in disguise. The kinsmen of the slain, after leading Hamilcar through the city in bonds and inflicting terrible tortures upon him, put him to death with the utmost indignities. Then the rulers of the city cut off his head and dispatched men to carry it into Libya to Agathocles and report to him the successes that had been gained. When the Carthaginian army after the disaster had taken place learned the cause of its misfortune, it was with difficulty relieved from its fears. There being no established commander, the barbarians separated from the Greeks. Then the exiles along with the other Greeks elected Deinocrates general, and the Carthaginians gave the command to those who had been second in rank to Hamilcar. About this time the Acragantines, seeing that the situation in Sicily was most favorable for an attempt, made a bid for the leadership of the whole island, for they believed that the Carthaginians would scarcely sustain the war against Agathocles, that Deinocrates was easy to conquer since he had collected an army of exiles, that the people of Syracuse, pinched by famine, would not even try to compete for the primacy, and, what was most important, that if they took the field to secure the independence of the cities, all would gladly answer the summons both through hatred for the barbarians and through the desire for self-government that is implanted in all men. They therefore elected Xenodicus as general, gave him an army suitable for the undertaking, and sent him forth to the war. He at once set out against Jela, was admitted at night by certain personal friends, and became master of the city together with its strong army and its wealth. 
The people of Jela, having been thus freed, joined in his campaign very eagerly and unanimously and set about freeing the cities. As news of the undertaking of the Agrigantines spread throughout the whole island, an impulse toward liberty made itself manifest in the cities. And first the people of Enna sent to the Agrigantines and delivered their city over to them, and when they had freed Enna, the Agrigantines went on to Urbesis, although a garrison stationed there was keeping watch over the city. After a bitter battle had taken place in which the citizens aided the Agrigantines, the garrison was captured and, although many of the barbarians fell, at least five hundred of them laid down their arms and surrendered. While the Agrigantines were thus engaged, some of the soldiers who had been left in Syracuse by Agathocles, after seizing Aketla, plundered Leontini and Camarina. Since the cities were suffering from the plundering of their fields and the destruction of all their crops, Xenoticus entered the region and freed the peoples of Leontini and Camarina from the war, and after taking Aketla, a walled town, by siege, he re-established democracy for its citizens and struck fear into the Syracusans, and, in general, as he advanced he liberated the strongholds and the cities from Carthaginian domination. Meantime the Syracusans, hard-pressed by famine and hearing that grain ships were about to make the voyage to Syracuse, manned twenty triremes and, watching the barbarians who were accustomed to lie at anchor off the harbour to catch them off guard, sailed out unseen and coasted along to Megara, where they waited for the approach of the traders. Afterwards, however, when the Carthaginians sailed out against them with thirty ships, they first tried to fight at sea, but were quickly driven to land and leapt from their ships at a certain shrine of Hera. Then a battle took place for the ships, and the Carthaginians, throwing grappling irons into the triremes and with great force dragging them off from the shore, captured ten of them, but the others were saved by men who came to the rescue from the city. And this was the condition of affairs in Sicily. In Libya, when those who were carrying the head of Hamilcar had come into port, Agathocles took the head and, riding near the hostile camp to within hearing distance, showed it to the enemy and related to them the defeat of their expedition. The Carthaginians, deeply grieved and prostrating themselves on the ground in barbarian fashion, regarded the death of the king as their own misfortune, and they fell into deep despair in regard to the whole war. But Agathocles, who was already elated by his successes in Libya when such strokes of fortune were now added, was borne aloft by soaring hopes, thinking himself freed from all dangers. Fortune notwithstanding did not permit success to remain long on the same side, but brought the greatest danger to the prince from his own soldiers. For Lysiscus, one of those who had been placed in command, invited to dinner by Agathocles, became drunk and insulted the prince. Now Agathocles, who valued the man for his services in the war, turned aside with a joke what had been said in bitterness, but his son, Archagathus, becoming angry, censured and threatened Lysiscus. When the drinking was concluded and the men were going away to their quarters, Lysiscus taunted Archagathus on the score of his adultery with his stepmother, for he was supposed to possess Alcia, for this was the woman's name, without his father's knowledge. Archagathus, driven into an overpowering rage, seized a spear from one of the guard and thrust Lysiscus through his ribs. Now he died at once and was carried away to his own tent by those whose task it was, but at daybreak the friends of the murdered men came together, and many of the other soldiers hastened to join them, and all were indignant at what had happened and filled the camp with uproar. Many, too, of those who had been placed in command, as they also were subject to accusation and feared for themselves, turned the crisis to their own advantage and kindled no inconsiderable sedition. When the whole army was full of indignation, the troops severally donned full armor to punish the murderer, and finally the mob made up its mind that Archagathus should be put to death, and that, if Agathocles did not surrender his son, he himself should pay the penalty in his place. And they also kept demanding the pay that was due them, and they elected generals to lead the army, and finally some of them seized the walls of Tunis and surrounded the princes with guards on every side. The Carthaginians, on learning of the discord among the enemy, sent men to them urging them to change sides, and promised to give them greater pay and noteworthy bonuses. And indeed many of the leaders did agree to take the army over to them, but Agathocles, seeing that his safety was in the balance and fearing that, if he should be delivered to the enemy, he would end his life amid insults, decided that it was better, if he had to suffer, to die at the hands of his own men. Therefore, putting aside the purple and donning the humble garb of a private citizen, he came out into the middle of the crowd. Silence fell because his action was unexpected, and when a crowd had run together, he delivered a speech suitable to the critical situation. 
After recalling his earlier achievements, he said that he was ready to die if that should seem best for his fellow soldiers, for never had he, constrained by cowardice, consented to endure any indignity through love of life and declaring that they themselves were witnesses of this, he bared his sword as if to slay himself. When he was on the point of striking the blow, the army shouted bidding him to stop, and from every side came voices clearing him from the charges. And when the crowd kept pressing him to resume his royal garb, he put on the dress of his rank, weeping and thanking the people, the crowd meanwhile acclaiming his restoration with a clash of arms. While the Carthaginians were waiting intently, expecting that the Greeks would very soon come over to them, Agathocles, not missing the opportunity, led his army against them. The barbarians, believing that their opponents were deserting to them, had no idea at all of what had actually taken place, and when Agathocles had drawn near the enemy, he suddenly ordered the signal for battle to be given, fell upon them, and created great havoc. The Carthaginians, stunned by the sudden reversal, lost many of their soldiers and fled into their camp. Thus Agathocles, after having fallen into the most extreme danger on account of his son, through his own excellence not only found a way out of his difficulties, but even defeated the enemy. Those, however, who were chiefly responsible for the sedition and any of the others who were hostile to the prince, more than two hundred in number, found the courage to desert to the Carthaginians. Now that we have completed the account of events in Libya and Sicily, we shall relate what took place in Italy. When the Etruscans had taken the field against the city Citrium, a Roman colony, the consuls, coming out to its aid with a strong army, defeated them in battle and drove them into their camp, but the Samnites at this time, when the Roman army was far distant, were plundering with impunity those Iapyges who supported the Romans. The consuls, therefore, were forced to divide their armies, Fabius remained in Etruria, but Martius, setting out against the Samnites, took the city Alifae by storm and freed from danger those of the allies who were being besieged. Fabius, however, while the Etruscans in great numbers were gathering against Sutrium, marched without the knowledge of the enemy through the country of their neighbors into Upper Etruria, which had not been plundered for a long time. Falling upon it unexpectedly, he ravaged a large part of the country, and in a victory over those of the inhabitants who came against him, he slew many of them and took no small number of them alive as prisoners. Thereafter, defeating the Etruscans in a second battle near the place called Perugia and destroying many of them, he overawed the nation since he was the first of the Romans to have invaded that region with an army. He also made truces with the peoples of Arecium and Cortona, likewise with those of Perugia, and, taking by siege the city called Castola, he forced the Etruscans to raise the siege of Citrium. In Rome in this year censors were elected, and one of them Appius Claudius, who had his colleague, Lucius Plautius, under his influence, changed many of the laws of the fathers, for since he was following a course of action pleasing to the people, he considered the Senate of no importance. In the first place he built the Appian Aqueduct, as it is called, from a distance of eighty states to Rome, and spent a large sum of public money for this construction without a decree of the Senate. Next he paved with solid stone the greater part of the Appian Way, which was named for him, from Rome to Capua, the distance being more than a thousand states. And since he dug through elevated places and leveled with noteworthy fills the ravines and valleys, he expended the entire revenue of the state but left behind a deathless monument to himself, having been ambitious in the public interest. He also mixed the Senate, enrolling not merely those who were of noble birth and superior rank as was the custom, but also including many sons of freedmen. For this reason those were incensed with him who boasted of their nobility. He also gave each citizen the right to be enrolled in whatever tribe he wished, and to be placed in the census class he preferred. In short, seeing hatred toward himself treasured up by the most distinguished men, he avoided giving offense to any of the other citizens, securing as a counterpoise against the hostility of the nobles the goodwill of the many. At the inspection of the equestrian order he deprived no man of his horse, and in drawing up the album of the Senate he removed no one of the unworthy senators, which it was the custom of the censors to do. Then the consuls, because of their hatred for him and their desire to please the most distinguished men, called together the Senate, not as it had been listed by him but as it had been entered in the album by the preceding censors, and the people in opposition to the nobles and in support of Appius, wishing also to establish firmly the promotion of their own class, elected to the more distinguished of the aedileships the son of a freedman, Nius Flavius, who was the first Roman whose father had been a slave to gain that office. 
When Appius had completed his term of office, as a precaution against the ill will of the Senate, he professed to be blind and remained in his house. When Carinus was archon in Athens, the Romans gave the consulship to Publius Decius and Quintus Fabius, and in Ellis the Olympian Games were celebrated for the 118th time, at which celebration Apollonides of Tegea won the foot race. At this time, while Ptolemy was sailing from Mindus with a strong fleet through the islands, he liberated Andrus as he passed by and drove out the garrison. Moving on to the Isthmus, he took Sicyon and Corinth from Cratesipolis. Since the causes that explain her becoming ruler of famous cities were made clear in the preceding book, we shall refrain from again discussing the same subject. Now Ptolemy planned to free the other Greek cities also, thinking that the goodwill of the Greeks would be a great gain for him in his own undertakings, but when the Peloponnesians, having agreed to contribute food and money, contributed nothing of what had been promised, the prince in anger made peace with Cassander, by the terms of which peace each prince was to remain master of the cities that he was holding. And after securing Sicyon and Corinth with a garrison, Ptolemy departed for Egypt. Meanwhile, Cleopatra quarreled with Antigonus and, inclining to cast her lot with Ptolemy, she started from Sardis in order to cross over to him. She was the sister of Alexander the conqueror of Persia and daughter of Philip, son of Amintas, and had been the wife of the Alexander who made an expedition into Italy. Because of the distinction of her descent Cassander and Lysimachus, as well as Antigonus and Ptolemy and in general all the leaders who were most important after Alexander's death, sought her hand, for each of them, hoping that the Macedonians would follow the lead of this marriage, was seeking alliance with the royal house in order thus to gain supreme power for himself. The governor of Sardis, who had orders from Antigonus to watch Cleopatra, prevented her departure, but later, as commanded by the prince, he treacherously brought about her death through the agency of certain women. But Antigonus, not wishing the murder to be laid at his door, punished some of the women for having plotted against her, and took care that the funeral should be conducted in royal fashion. Thus Cleopatra, after having been the prize in a contest among the most eminent leaders, met this fate before her marriage was brought to pass. Now that we have related the events of Asia and of Greece, we shall turn our narrative to the other parts of the inhabited world. In Libya, when the Carthaginians had sent out an army to win over the nomads who had deserted, Agathocles left his son Archagathus before Tunis with part of the army, but he himself, selecting the strongest men, 8,000 foot, 800 horse, and 50 Libyan chariots, followed after the enemy at full speed. When the Carthaginians had come to the tribe of nomads called the Ziphons, they won over many of the inhabitants and brought back some of the deserters to their former alliance, but on learning that the enemy were at hand, they camped on a certain hill, which was surrounded by streams that were deep and difficult to cross. These they used as a protection against the unexpected attacks of their opponents, but they directed the fittest of the nomads to follow the Greeks closely and by harassing them to prevent them from advancing. When these did as they had been directed, Agathocles sent against them his slingers and bowmen, but he himself with the rest of his army advanced against the camp of the enemy. The Carthaginians on discovering his intention led their army out from their camp, drew it up, and took their positions ready for battle. But when they saw that Agathocles was already crossing the river, they attacked in formation, and at the stream, which was difficult to ford, they slew many of their opponents. However, as Agathocles pressed forward, the Greeks were superior in valor, but the barbarians had the advantage of numbers. Then when the armies had been fighting gallantly for some time, the nomads on both sides withdrew from the battle and awaited the outcome of the struggle, intending to plunder the baggage train of those who were defeated. But Agathocles, who had his best men about him, first forced back those opposite to him, and by their rout he caused the rest of the barbarians to flee. Of the cavalry only the Greeks who, led by Clinon, were assisting the Carthaginians withstood Agathocles' heavy armed men as they advanced. Although they struggled brilliantly, most of these Greeks were slain while fighting gallantly, and those who survived were saved by mere chance. Agathocles, giving up the pursuit of the cavalry, attacked the barbarians who had taken refuge in the camp, and, since he had to force his way over terrain steep and difficult of access, he suffered losses no less great than those he inflicted on the Carthaginians. Nevertheless, he did not slacken his zeal, but rather, made confident by his victory, pressed on, expecting to take the camp by storm. At this, the nomads who were awaiting the outcome of the battle, not being able to fall on the baggage train of the Carthaginians since both armies were fighting near the camp, made an attack on the encampment of the Greeks, knowing that Agathocles had been drawn off to a great distance. 
Since the camp was without defenders capable of warding them off, they easily launched an attack, killing the few who resisted them and gaining possession of a large number of prisoners and of booty as well. On hearing this Agathocles led his army back quickly and recovered some of the spoil, but most of it the nomads kept in their possession, and as night came on they withdrew to a distance. The prince, after setting up a trophy, divided the booty among the soldiers so that no one might complain about his losses, but the captured Greeks, who had been fighting for the Carthaginians, he put into a certain fortress. Now these men, dreading punishment from the prince, attacked those in the fortress at night and, although defeated in the battle, occupied a strong position, being in number not less than a thousand, of whom above five hundred were Syracusans. However, when Agathocles heard what had happened, he came with his army, induced them to leave their position under a truce, and slaughtered all those who had made the attack. After he had finished this battle, Agathocles, examining in mind every device for bringing the Carthaginians into subjection, sent Orton the Syracusan as an envoy into Cyrene to Ophelas. The latter was one of the companions who had made the campaign with Alexander, now master of the cities of Cyrene and of a strong army, he was ambitious for a greater realm. And so it was to a man in this state of mind that there came the envoy from Agathocles inviting him to join him in subduing the Carthaginians. In return for this service Orton promised Ophelas that Agathocles would permit him to exercise dominion over Libya. For, he said, Sicily was enough for Agathocles, if only it should be possible for him, relieved of danger from Carthage, to rule over all the island without fear. Moreover, Italy was close at his hand for increasing his realm if he should decide to reach after greater things. For Libya, separated by a wide and dangerous sea, did not suit him at all, into which land he had even now come through no desire, but because of necessity. O fellas, now that to his long-considered judgment was added this actual hope, gladly consented and sent to the Athenians an envoy to confer about an alliance, for O fellas had married Euthydus, the daughter of a Miltiades who traced that name back to him who had commanded the victorious troops at Marathon. On account of this marriage and the other marks of favor which he had habitually displayed toward their city, a good many of the Athenians eagerly enlisted for the campaign. No small number also of the other Greeks were quick to join in the undertaking whence they hoped to portion out for colonization the most fertile part of Libya and to plunder the wealth of Carthage. For conditions throughout Greece on account of the continuous wars and the mutual rivalries of the princes had become unstable and straitened, and they expected not only to gain many advantages, but also to rid themselves of their present evils. And so Ophelas, when everything for his campaign had been prepared magnificently, set out with his army, having more than ten thousand foot soldiers, six hundred horsemen, a hundred chariots, and more than three hundred charioteers and men to fight beside them. There followed also of those who are termed non-combatants not less than ten thousand, and many of these brought their children and wives and other possessions, so that the army was like a colonizing expedition. When they had marched for eighteen days and had traversed three thousand stades, they encamped at Atamala, thence as they advanced there was a mountain, precipitous on both sides, but with a deep ravine in the center, from which extended a smooth rock that rose up to a lofty peak. At the base of this rock was a large cave thickly covered with ivy and bryony, in which according to myth had been born Lamia, a queen of surpassing beauty. But on account of the savagery of her heart they say that the time that has elapsed since has transformed her face to a bestial aspect. For when all the children born to her had died, weighed down in her misfortune and envying the happiness of all other women and their children, she ordered that the newborn babes be snatched from their mother's arms and straightway slain. Wherefore among us even down to the present generation, the story of this woman remains among the children and her name is most terrifying to them. But whenever she drank freely, she gave to all the opportunity to do what they pleased unobserved. Therefore, since she did not trouble herself about what was taking place at such times, the people of the land assumed that she could not see. And for that reason some tell in the myth that she threw her eyes into a flask, metaphorically turning the carelessness that is most complete amid wine into the aforesaid measure, since it was a measure of wine that took away her sight. One might also present Euripides as a witness that she was born in Libya, for he says, who does not know the name of Lamia, Libyan in race, a name of greatest reproach among mortals. Now Ophelas with his army was advancing with great difficulty through a waterless land filled with savage creatures, for not only did he lack water, but since dry food also gave out, he was in danger of losing his entire army. 
Fanged monsters of all kinds infest the desert near the Sirtis, and the bite of most of these is fatal, therefore it was a great disaster into which they were fallen since they were not helped by remedies supplied by physicians and friends. For some of the serpents, since they had a skin very like in appearance to the ground that was beneath them, made their own forms invisible, and many of the men, treading upon these in ignorance, received bites that were fatal. Finally, after suffering great hardships on the march for more than two months, they with difficulty completed the journey to Agathocles and encamped, keeping the two forces a short distance apart. The Carthaginians, on hearing of their presence, were panic-stricken, seeing that so great a force had arrived against them, but Agathocles, going to meet Ophelas and generously furnishing all needed supplies, begged him to relieve his army from its distress. He himself remained for some days and carefully observed all that was being done in the camp of the new arrivals. When the larger part of the soldiers had scattered to find fodder and food, and when he saw that Ophelas had no suspicion of what he himself had planned, he summoned an assembly of his own soldiers and, after accusing the man who had come to join the alliance as if he were plotting against himself and thus rousing the anger of his men, straightway led his army in full array against the Cyrenians. Then Ophelas, stunned by this unexpected action, attempted to defend himself, but, pressed for time, the forces that he had remaining in camp not being adequate, he died fighting. Agathocles forced the rest of the army to lay down its arms, and by winning them all over with generous promises, he became master of the whole army. Thus Ophelas, who had cherished great hopes and had rashly entrusted himself to another, met an end so inglorious. In Carthage Bormilcar, who had long planned to make an attempt at tyranny, was seeking a proper occasion for his private schemes. Time and again when circumstances put him in a position to carry out what he had planned, some little cause intervened to thwart him. For those who are about to undertake lawless and important enterprises are superstitious and always choose delay rather than action, and postponement rather than accomplishment. This happened also on this occasion and in regard to this man, for he sent out the most distinguished of the citizens to the campaign against the nomads so that he might have no men of consequence to oppose him, but he did not venture to make an open bid for the tyranny, being held back by caution. But it happened that at the time when Agathocles attacked Ophelas, Bormilcar made his effort to gain the tyranny, each of the two being ignorant of what the enemy was doing. Agathocles did not know of the attempt at tyranny and of the confusion in the city when he might easily have become master of Carthage, for when Bormilcar was discovered in the act he would have preferred to cooperate with Agathocles rather than pay the penalty in his own person to the citizens. And again, the Carthaginians had not heard of Agathocles' attack, for they might easily have overpowered him with the aid of the army of Ophelas. But I suppose that not without reason did such ignorance prevail on both sides, although the actions were on a large scale and those who had undertaken deeds of such daring were near each other. For Agathocles, when about to kill a man who was his friend, paid attention to nothing that was happening among his enemies, and Bormilcar, when depriving his fatherland of its liberty, did not concern himself at all with events in the camp of the enemy, since he had as a fixed purpose in his mind to conquer at the time, not his enemies, but his fellow citizens. At this point one might censure the art of history when he observes that in life many different actions are consummated at the same time, but that it is necessary for those who record them to interrupt the narrative and to parcel out different times to simultaneous events contrary to nature, with the result that, although the actual experience of the events contains the truth, yet the written record, deprived of such power, while presenting copies of the events, falls far short of arranging them as they really were. Be that as it may, when Bormilcar had reviewed the soldiers in what was called the New City, which is a short distance from old Carthage, he dismissed the rest, but holding those who were his confederates in the plot, five hundred citizens and about a thousand mercenaries, he declared himself tyrant. Dividing his soldiers into five bands, he attacked, slaughtering those who opposed him in the streets. Since an extraordinary tumult broke out everywhere in the city, the Carthaginians at first supposed that the enemy had made his way in and that the city was being betrayed, when, however, the true situation became known, the young men ran together, formed companies, and advanced against the tyrant. But Bormilcar, killing those in the streets, moved swiftly in the marketplace, and finding there many of the citizens unarmed, he slaughtered them. The Carthaginians, however, after occupying the buildings about the marketplace, which were tall, hurled missiles thick and fast, and the participants in the uprising began to be struck down since the whole place was within range. 
Therefore, since they were suffering severely, they closed ranks and forced their way out through the narrow streets into the new city, being continuously struck with missiles from whatever houses they chanced at any time to be near. After these had occupied a certain elevation, the Carthaginians, now that all the citizens had assembled in arms, drew up their forces against those who had taken part in the uprising. Finally, sending as envoys such of the oldest men as were qualified and offering amnesty, they came to terms. Against the rest, they invoked no penalty on account of the dangers that surrounded the city, but they cruelly tortured Bormilkar himself and put him to death, paying no heed to the oaths which had been given. In this way, then, the Carthaginians, after having been in the gravest danger, preserved the constitution of their fathers. Agathocles, loading cargo vessels with his spoil and embarking on them those of the men who had come from Cyrene who were useless for war, sent them to Syracuse. But storms arose, and some of the ships were destroyed, some were driven to the Pythecusan islands off the coast of Italy, and a few came safe to Syracuse. In Italy the Roman consuls, going to the aid of the Marsi, against whom the Samnites were making war, were victorious in the battle and slew many of the enemy. Then, crossing the territory of the Umbrians, they invaded Etruria, which was hostile, and took by siege the fortress called Cyarium. When the people of the region sent envoys to ask a truce, the consuls made a truce for forty years with the Tarquinians, but with all the other Etruscans for one year, when that year had come to an end, Anaxocrates was archon in Athens and in Rome Appius Claudius and Lucius Volumnius became consuls. While these held office, Demetrius, the son of Antigonus, having received from his father strong land and sea forces, also a suitable supply of missiles and of the other things requisite for carrying on a siege, set sail from Ephesus. He had instructions to free all the cities throughout Greece, but first of all Athens, which was held by a garrison of Cassander. Sailing into the Piraeus with his forces, he at once made an attack on all sides and issued a proclamation. Dionysius, who had been placed in command of the garrison on Nunicia, and Demetrius of Phalerum, who had been made military governor of the city by Cassander, resisted him from the walls with many soldiers. Some of Antigonus' men, attacking with violence and effecting an entrance along the coast, admitted many of their fellow soldiers within the wall. The result was that in this way the Piraeus was taken, and, of those within it, Dionysius the commander fled to Munichia and Demetrius of Phalerum withdrew into the city. On the next day, when he had been sent with others as envoys by the people to Demetrius and had discussed the independence of the city and his own security, he obtained a safe conduct for himself and, giving up the direction of Athens, fled to Thebes and later into Egypt to Ptolemy. And so this man, after he had been director of the city for ten years, was driven from his fatherland in the way described. The Athenian people, having recovered their freedom, decreed honors to those responsible for their liberation. Demetrius, however, bringing up ballistae and the other engines of war and missiles, assaulted Munichia both by land and by sea. When those within defended themselves stoutly from the walls, it turned out that Dionysius had the advantage of the difficult terrain and the greater height of his position, for Munichia was strong both by nature and by the fortifications which had been constructed, but that Demetrius was many times superior in the number of his soldiers and had a great advantage in his equipment. Finally, after the attack had continued unremittingly for two days, the defenders, severely wounded by the catapults and the ballistae and not having any men to relieve them, had the worst of it, and the men of Demetrius, who were fighting in relays and were continually relieved, after the wall had been cleared by the ballistae, broke into Munichia, forced the garrison to lay down its arms, and took the commander Dionysius alive. After gaining these successes in a few days and raising Munichia completely, Demetrius restored to the people their freedom and established friendship and an alliance with them. The Athenians, Stratocles writing the decree, voted to set up golden statues of Antigonus and Demetrius in a chariot near the statues of Harmodius and Aristogeiton, to give them both honorary crowns at a cost of two hundred talents, to consecrate an altar to them and call it the Altar of the Saviors, to add to the ten tribes two more, Demetrius and Antigones to hold annual games in their honor with a procession and a sacrifice, and to weave their portraits in the peplos of Athena. Thus the common people, deprived of power in the Lamian War by Antipater, fifteen years afterwards unexpectedly recovered the constitution of the fathers. Although Megara was held by a garrison, Demetrius took it by siege, restored their autonomy to its people, and received noteworthy honors from those whom he had served.
when an embassy had come to Antigonus from Athens and had delivered to him the decree concerning the honors conferred upon him and discussed with him the problem of grain and of timber for ships, he gave to them 150,000 medimni of grain and timber sufficient for 100 ships, he also withdrew his garrison from Imbrus and gave the city back to the Athenians. He wrote to his son Demetrius ordering him to call together counselors from the allied cities who should consider in common what was advantageous for Greece, and to sail himself with his army to Cyprus and finish the war with the generals of Ptolemy as soon as possible. Demetrius, promptly doing all according to his father's orders, moved toward Curia and summoned the Rhodians for the war against Ptolemy. They did not obey, preferring to maintain a common peace with all, and this was the beginning of the hostility between that people and Antigonus. Demetrius, after coasting along to Cilicia and there assembling additional ships and soldiers, sailed to Cyprus with 15,000 foot soldiers and 400 horsemen, more than 110 swift triremes, 53 heavier transports, and freighters of every kind sufficient for the strength of his cavalry and infantry. First he went into camp on the coast of Carpasia, and after beaching his ships, strengthened his encampment with a palisade and a deep moat, then, making raids on the peoples who lived nearby, he took by storm Urania and Carpasia, then leaving an adequate guard for the ships, he moved with his forces against Salamis. Menelaus, who had been made general of the island by Ptolemy, had gathered his soldiers from the outposts and was waiting in Salamis, but when the enemy was at a distance of forty stades, he came out with twelve thousand foot and about eight hundred horse. In a battle of short duration which occurred, the forces of Menelaus were overwhelmed and routed, and Demetrius, pursuing the enemy into the city, took prisoners numbering not much less than three thousand and killed about a thousand. At first, he freed the captives of all charges and distributed them among the units of his own soldiers, but when they ran off to Menelaus, because their baggage had been left behind in Egypt with Ptolemy, recognizing that they would not change sides, he forced them to embark on his ships and sent them off to Antigonus in Syria. At this time Antigonus was tarrying in Upper Syria, founding a city on the Orontes River, which he called Antigonia, after himself. He laid it out on a lavish scale, making its perimeter seventy stades, for the location was naturally well adapted for watching over Babylon and the Upper Satrapies, and again for keeping an eye upon Lower Syria and the Satrapies near Egypt. It happened, however, that the city did not survive very long, for Seleucus dismantled it and transported it to the city which he founded and called Seleucia after himself. But we shall make these matters clear in detail when we come to the proper time. As to affairs in Cyprus, Menelaus, after having been defeated in the battle, had missiles and engines brought to the walls, assigned positions on the battlements to his soldiers, and made ready for the fight, and since he saw that Demetrius was also making preparations for siege, he sent messengers into Egypt to Ptolemy to inform him about the defeat and to ask him to send aid as his interests on the island were in danger. Since Demetrius saw that the city of the Salaminians was not to be despised and that a large force was in the city defending it, he determined to prepare siege engines of very great size, catapults for shooting bolts and ballistae of all kinds, and the other equipment that would strike terror. He sent for skilled workmen from Asia, and for iron, likewise for a large amount of wood and for the proper complement of other supplies. When everything was made ready for him, he constructed a device called the Helepolis, which had a length of 45 cubits on each side and a height of 90 cubits. It was divided into nine stories, and the whole was mounted on four solid wheels each eight cubits high. He also constructed very large battering rams and two penthouses to carry them. On the lower levels of the Helepolis he mounted all sorts of ballistae, the largest of them capable of hurling missiles weighing three talents, on the middle levels he placed the largest catapults, and on the highest his lightest catapults and a large number of ballistae, and he also stationed on the Helepolis more than two hundred men to operate these engines in the proper manner. Bringing the engines up to the city and hurling a shower of missiles, he cleared the battlements with the ballistae and shattered the walls with the rams. Since those within resisted boldly and opposed his engines of war with other devices, for some days the battle was doubtful, both sides suffering hardships and severe wounds, and when finally the wall was falling and the city was in danger of being taken by storm, the assault was interrupted by the coming of night. Menelaus, seeing clearly that the city would be taken unless he tried something new, gathered a large amount of dry wood, at about midnight threw this upon the siege engines of the enemy, and at the same time all shot down fire-bearing arrows from the walls and set on fire the largest of the siege engines. As the flames suddenly blazed high, Demetrius tried to come to the rescue, but the flames got the start of him, with the result that the engines were completely destroyed and many of those who manned them were lost. 
Demetrius, although disappointed in his expectations, did not stop but pushed the siege persistently by both land and sea, believing that he would overcome the enemy in time. When Ptolemy heard of the defeat of his men, he sailed from Egypt with considerable land and sea forces. Reaching Cyprus at Paphos, he received ships from the cities and coasted along to Sidium, which was distant from Salami's 200 stades. He had in all 140 ships of war, of which the largest were quinquiremes and the smallest quadriremes, more than 200 transports followed, which carried at least 10,000 foot soldiers. Ptolemy sent certain men to Menelaus by land, directing him, if possible, to send him quickly the ships from Salamis, which numbered sixty, for he hoped that, if he received these as reinforcement, he would easily be superior in the naval engagement since he would have two hundred ships in the battle. Learning of his intention, Demetrius left a part of his forces for the siege, and, manning all his ships and embarking upon them the best of his soldiers, he equipped them with missiles and ballistae and mounted on the prows a sufficient number of catapults for throwing bolts three spans in length. After making the fleet ready in every way for a naval battle, he sailed around the city and, anchoring at the mouth of the harbor just out of range, spent the night, preventing the ships from the city from joining the others, and at the same time watching for the coming of the enemy and occupying a position ready for battle. When Ptolemy sailed up toward Salamis, the service vessels following at a distance, his fleet was awe-inspiring to behold because of the multitude of its ships. When Demetrius observed Ptolemy's approach, he left the Admiral Antisthenes with ten of the quinquiremes to prevent the ships in the city from going forth for the battle, since the harbor had a narrow exit, and he ordered the cavalry to patrol the shore so that, if any wreck should occur, they might rescue those who should swim across to the land. He himself drew up the fleet and moved against the enemy with 108 ships in all, including those that had been provided with crews from the captured towns. The largest of the ships were sevens, and most of them were quinquiremes. The left wing was composed of seven Phoenician sevens and thirty Athenian quadriremes, Medius, the admiral, having the command. Sailing behind these he placed ten sixes and as many quinquiremes, for he had decided to make strong this wing where he himself was going to fight the decisive battle. In the middle of the line he stationed the lightest of his ships, which the Mycen of Samos and Marcias, who compiled the history of Macedonia, commanded. The right wing was commanded by Hegesippus of Halicarnassus and Pleistias of Kos, who was the chief pilot of the whole fleet. At first, while it was still night, Ptolemy made for Salamis at top speed, believing that he could gain an entrance before the enemy was ready, but as day broke, the fleet of the enemy in battle array was visible at no great distance, and Ptolemy also prepared for the battle. Ordering the supply ships to follow at a distance and effecting a suitable formation of the other ships, he himself took command of the left wing with the largest of his warships fighting under him. After the fleet had been disposed in this way, both sides prayed to the gods as was the custom, the signal men leading and the crews joining in the response. The princes, since they were about to fight for their lives and their all, were in much anxiety. When Demetrius was about three states distant from the enemy, he raised the battle signal that had been agreed upon, a gilded shield, and this sign was made known to all by being repeated in relays. Since Ptolemy also gave a similar signal, the distance between the fleets was rapidly reduced. When the trumpets gave the signal for battle and both forces raised the battle cry, all the ships rushed to the encounter in a terrifying manner, using their bows and their ballistae at first, then their javelins in a shower, the men wounded those who were within range, then when the ships had come close together and the encounter was about to take place with violence, the soldiers on the decks crouched down and the oarsmen, spurred on by the signal men, bent more desperately to their oars. As the ships drove together with force and violence, in some cases they swept off each other's oars so that the ships became useless for flight or pursuit, and the men who were on board, though eager for a fight, were prevented from joining in the battle, but where the ships had met prow to prow with their rams, they drew back for another charge, and the soldiers on board shot at each other with effect since the mark was close at hand for each party. Some of the men, when their captains had delivered a broadside blow and the rams had become firmly fixed, leaped aboard the ships of the enemy, receiving and giving severe wounds, for certain of them, after grasping the rail of a ship that was drawing near, missed their footing, fell into the sea, and at once were killed with spears by those who stood above them, and others, making good their intent, slew some of the enemy and, forcing others along the narrow deck, drove them into the sea. As a whole, the fighting was varied and full of surprises, many times those who were weaker got the upper hand because of the height of their ships, and those who were stronger were foiled by inferiority of position and by the irregularity with which things happen in fighting of this kind. 
for in contests on land, valor is made clearly evident, since it is able to gain the upper hand when nothing external and fortuitous interferes, but in naval battles there are many causes of various kinds that, contrary to reason, defeat those who would properly gain the victory through prowess. Demetrius fought most brilliantly of all, having taken his stand on the stern of his seven. A crowd of men rushed upon him, but by hurling his javelins at some of them and by striking others at close range with his spear, he slew them, and although many missiles of all sorts were aimed at him, he avoided some that he saw in time and received others upon his defensive armor. Of the three men who protected him with shields, one fell struck by a lance and the other two were severely wounded. Finally Demetrius drove back the forces confronting him, created a rout in the right wing, and forthwith forced even the ships next to the wing to flee. Ptolemy who had with himself the heaviest of his ships and the strongest men easily routed those stationed opposite him, sinking some of the ships and capturing others with their crews. Turning back from that victorious action, he expected easily to subdue the others also, but when he saw that the right wing of his forces had been shattered and all those next to that wing driven into flight, and further, that Demetrius was pressing on with full force, he sailed back to Sidium. Demetrius, after winning the victory, gave the transports to Neon and Buricus, ordering them to pursue and pick up those who were swimming in the sea, and he himself, decking his own ships with bow and stern ornaments and towing the captured craft, sailed to his camp and his home port. At the time of the naval battle Menelaus, the general in Salamis, had manned his sixty ships and sent them as a reinforcement to Ptolemy, placing Menoetius in command. When a battle occurred at the harbor mouth with the ships on guard there, and when the ships from the city pressed forward vigorously, Demetrius' ten ships fled to the camp of the army, and Menoetius, after sailing out and arriving a little too late, returned to Salamis. In the naval battle, whose outcome was as stated, more than a hundred of the supply ships were taken, upon which were almost eight thousand soldiers, and of the warships forty were captured with their crews, and about eighty were disabled, which the victors towed, full of sea water, to the camp before the city. Twenty of Demetrius' ships were disabled, but all of these, after receiving proper care, continued to perform the services for which they were suited. Thereafter, Ptolemy gave up the fight in Cyprus and returned to Egypt. Demetrius, after he had taken over all the cities of the island and their garrisons, enrolled the men in companies, and when they were organized they came to sixteen thousand foot and about six hundred horse. He at once sent messengers to his father to inform him of the successes, embarking them on his largest ship. And when Antigonus heard of the victory that had been gained, elated by the magnitude of his good fortune, he assumed the diadem and from that time on he used the style of king, and he permitted Demetrius also to assume the same title and rank. Ptolemy, however, not at all humbled in spirit by his defeat, also assumed the diadem and always signed himself king. And in a similar fashion in rivalry with them the rest of the princes also called themselves kings, Seleucus, who had recently gained the upper satrapies, and Lysimachus and Cassander, who still retained the territories originally allotted to them. Now that we have said enough about these matters, we shall relate in their turn the events that took place in Libya and in Sicily. When Agathocles heard that the princes whom we have just mentioned had assumed the diadem, since he thought that neither in power nor in territory nor in deeds was he inferior to them, he called himself king. He decided not to take a diadem, for he habitually wore a chaplet, which at the time when he seized the tyranny was his because of some priesthood and which he did not give up while he was struggling to gain the supreme power. But some say that he originally had made it his habit to wear this because he did not have a good head of hair. However this may be, in his desire to do something worthy of this title, he made a campaign against the people of Utica, who had deserted him. Making a sudden attack upon their city and taking prisoner those of the citizens who were caught in the open country to the number of three hundred, he at first offered a free pardon and requested the surrender of the city, but when those in the city did not heed his offer, he constructed a siege engine, hung the prisoners upon it, and brought it up to the walls. The Uticans pitted the unfortunate men, yet, holding the liberty of all of more account than the safety of these, they assigned posts on the walls to the soldiers and bravely awaited the assault. Then Agathocles, placing upon the engine his catapults, slingers, and bowmen, and fighting from this, began the assault, applying, as it were, branding irons to the souls of those within the city. Those standing on the walls at first hesitated to use their missiles since the targets presented to them were their own fellow countrymen, of whom some were indeed the most distinguished of their citizens, but when the enemy pressed on more heavily, they were forced to defend themselves against those who manned the engine. 
As a result, there came unparalleled suffering and despiteful treatment of fortune to the men of Utica, placed as they were in dire straits from which there was no escape, for since the Greeks had set up before them as shields the men of Utica who had been captured, it was necessary either to spare these and idly watch the fatherland fall into the hands of the enemy or, in protecting the city, to slaughter mercilessly a large number of unfortunate fellow citizens. And this, indeed, is what took place, for as they resisted the enemy and employed missiles of every kind, they shot down some of the men who stationed on the engine, and they also mangled some of their fellow citizens who were hanging there, and others they nailed to the engine with the bolts at whatever places on the body the missiles chanced to strike, so that the wanton violence and the punishment almost amounted to crucifixion. And this fate befell some at the hands of kinsmen and friends, if so it chanced, since necessity is not curiously concerned for what is holy among men. But when Agathocles saw that they were cold-bloodedly intent on fighting, he put his army in position to attack from every side and, forcing an entrance at a point where the wall had been poorly constructed, broke into the city. As some of the Eutychians fled into their houses, others into temples, Agathocles, enraged as he was against them, filled the city with slaughter. Some he killed in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, those who were captured he hanged, and those who had fled to temples and altars of the gods he cheated of their hopes. When he had sacked the movable property, he left a garrison in possession of the city, and led his army into position against the place called Hippoacra, which was made naturally strong by the marsh that lay before it. After laying siege to this with vigor and getting the better of its people in a naval battle, he took it by storm. When he had conquered the cities in this way, he became master both of most of the places along the sea and of the peoples dwelling in the interior except the nomads, of whom some arrived at terms of friendship with him and some awaited the final issue. For four stocks have divided Libya, the Phoenicians, who at that time occupied Carthage, the Liby Phoenicians, who have many cities along the sea and intermarry with the Carthaginians, and who received this name as a result of the interwoven ties of kinship. Of the inhabitants the race that was most numerous and oldest was called Libyan, and they hated the Carthaginians with a special bitterness because of the weight of their overlordship, and last were the nomads, who pastured their herds over a large part of Libya as far as the desert. Now that Agathocles was superior to the Carthaginians by reason of his Libyan allies and his own armies, but was much troubled about the situation in Sicily, he constructed light ships and pentaconters and placed upon them two thousand soldiers. Leaving his son Agatharchus in command of affairs in Libya, he put out with his ships and made the voyage to Sicily. While this was happening, Xenodicus, the general of the Acragantines, having freed many of the cities and roused in the Sicilians' great hopes of autonomy throughout the whole island, led his army against the generals of Agathocles. It consisted of more than 10,000 foot soldiers and nearly a thousand horsemen. Leptons and Demophilus, assembling from Syracuse in the fortresses as many men as they could, took up a position opposite him with 8,200 foot soldiers and 1,200 horse. In a bitter fight that ensued, Xenodicus was defeated and fled to Acragas, losing not less than 1,500 of his soldiers. The people of Acragas after meeting with this reverse put an end to their own most noble enterprise and, at the same time, to their allies' hopes of freedom. Shortly after this battle had taken place, Agathocles put in its Salinas in Sicily and forced the people of Heraclea, who had made their city free, to submit to him once more. Having crossed to the other side of the island, he attached to himself by a treaty the people of Therma, granting safe conduct to the Carthaginian garrison. Then, after taking Cephalidium and leaving Leptons as its governor, he himself marched through the interior and attempted to slip by night into Centuripa, where some of the citizens were to admit him. When their plan was discovered, however, and the guard came to the defense, he was thrown out of the city, losing more than five hundred of his soldiers. Thereupon, men from Apollonia having invited him and promised to betray their fatherland, he came to that city. As the traitors had become known and had been punished, he attacked the city but without effect for the first day, and on the next, after suffering heavily and losing a large number of men, he barely succeeded in taking it. After slaughtering most of the Apollonians, he plundered their possessions. While Agathocles was engaged on these matters, Deinocrates, the leader of the exiles, taking over the policy of the Acragantines and proclaiming himself champion of the common liberty, caused many to flock to him from all sides, for some eagerly gave ear to his appeals because of the desire for independence inborn in all men, and others because of their fear of Agathocles. 
when Deanacrates had collected almost 20,000 foot soldiers and 1,500 mounted men, all of the men who had had uninterrupted experience of exile and hardship, he camped in the open, challenging the tyrant to battle. However, when Agathocles, who was far inferior in strength, avoided battle, he speedily followed on his heels, having secured his victory without a struggle. From this time on the fortunes of Agathocles, not only in Sicily but also in Libya, suffered a change for the worse. Archagathus, who had been left by him as general, after the departure of his father at first gained some advantage by sending into the inland regions a part of the army under the command of Eumachus. This leader, after taking the rather large city of Tokai, won over many of the nomads who dwelt nearby. Then, capturing another city called Feline, he forced the submission of those who used the adjacent country as pasture, men called the Asphodelodes, who are similar to the Ethiopians in color. The third city that he took was Mesquila, which was very large and had been founded long ago by the Greeks who were returning from Troy, about whom we have already spoken in the third book. Next he took the place called Hippoacra, which has the same name as that captured by storm by Agathocles, and finally the free city called Acres, which he gave to his soldiers for plundering after he had enslaved the people. After sating his army with booty, he returned to Archagathus, and since he had gained a name for good service, he again led an army into the inland regions of Libya. Passing by the cities that he had previously mastered, he gained an entrance into the city called Miltine, having appeared before it without warning, but when the barbarians gathered together against him and overpowered him in the streets, he was, to his great surprise, driven out and lost many of his men. Departing thence, he marched through a high mountain range that extended for about two hundred stades and was full of wildcats, in which, accordingly, no birds would ever nested either among the trees or the ravines because of the rapacity of the aforementioned beasts. Crossing this range, he came out into a country containing a large number of apes and to three cities called from these beasts Pithecusi, if the name is translated into the Greek language. In these cities, many of the customs were very different from those current among us. For the apes lived in the same houses as the men, being regarded among them as gods, just as the dogs are among the Egyptians, and from the provisions laid up in the storerooms the beasts took their food without hindrance whenever they wished. Parents usually gave their children names taken from the apes, just as we do from the gods. For any who killed this animal, as if he had committed the greatest sacrilege, death was established as the penalty. For this reason, among some there was current a proverbial saying about those slain with impunity that they were paying the penalty for a monkey's blood. However this may be, Eumachus, after taking one of these cities by storm, destroyed it, but the other two he won over by persuasion. When, however, he heard that the neighboring barbarians were collecting great forces against him, he pushed on more vigorously, having decided to go back to the regions by the sea. Up to this time all the campaign in Libya had been satisfactory to Archagathus. But after this the Senate in Carthage took good counsel about the war and the senators decided to form three armies and send them forth from the city, one against the cities of the coast, one into the midland regions, and one into the interior. They thought that if they did this they would in the first place relieve the city of the siege and at the same time of the scarcity of food, for since many people from all parts had taken refuge in Carthage, there had resulted a general scarcity, the supply of provisions being already exhausted, but there was no danger from the siege since the city was inaccessible because of the protection afforded by the walls and the sea. In the second place, they assumed that the Allies would continue more loyal if there were more armies in the field aiding them. And, what was most important, they hoped that the enemy would be forced to divide his forces and to withdraw to a distance from Carthage. All of these aims were accomplished according to their purpose, for when 30,000 soldiers had been sent out from the city, the men who were left behind as a garrison not only had enough to maintain themselves, but out of their abundance they enjoyed everything in profusion, and the allies, who hitherto, because of their fear of the enemy, were compelled to make terms with him again gained courage and hastened to return to the formerly existing friendship. When Archagathus saw that all Libya was being occupied in sections by hostile armies, he himself also divided his army, part he sent into the coastal region, and of the rest of his forces he gave part to Escrian and sent him forth, and part he led himself, leaving an adequate garrison in Tunis. When so many armies were wandering everywhere in the country and when a decisive crisis in the campaign was expected, all anxiously awaited the final outcome. 
now Hanno, who commanded the army of the Midland region, laid an ambush for Eskrian and fell on him suddenly, slaying more than 4,000 foot soldiers and about 200 mounted troops, among whom was the general himself, of the others some were captured and some escaped in safety to Arcagathus, who was about 500 states distant. As for Himilco, who had been appointed to conduct the campaign into the interior, at first he rested in a certain city lying in wait for Eumachus, who was dragging along his army heavily loaded with the spoils from the captured cities. Then when the Greeks drew up their forces and challenged him to battle, Himilco left part of his army under arms in the city, giving them orders that, when he retired in pretended flight, they should burst out upon the pursuers. He himself, leading out half of his soldiers and joining battle a little distance in front of the encampment, at once took to flight as if panic-stricken. Eumachus' men, elated by their victory and giving no thought at all to their formation, followed, and in confusion pressed hard upon those who were withdrawing, but when suddenly from another part of the city there poured forth the army all ready for battle and when a great host shouted at a single command, they became panic-stricken. Accordingly, when the barbarians fell upon an enemy who had been thrown into disorder and frightened by the sudden onslaught, the immediate result was the rout of the Greeks. Since the Carthaginians cut off the enemy's return to his camp, Eumachus was forced to withdraw to the nearby hill, which was ill-supplied with water. When the Phoenicians invested the place, the Greeks, who had become weak from thirst and were being overpowered by the enemy, were almost all killed. In fact, of 8,000 foot soldiers only 30 were saved, and of 800 horsemen 40 escaped from the battle. After meeting with so great a disaster Archagathus returned to Tunis. He summoned from all sides the survivors of the soldiers who had been sent out, and he sent messengers to Sicily to report to his father what had happened and to urge him to come to his aid with all possible speed. In addition to the preceding disasters, another loss befell the Greeks, for all their allies except a few deserted them and the armies of the enemy gathered together and, pitching camp nearby, lay in wait for them. Himilco occupied the passes and shut off his opponents, who were at a distance of a hundred stades, from the routes leading from the region, and on the other side Atarbas camped at a distance of forty stades from Tunis. Therefore, since the enemy controlled not only the sea but also the land, the Greeks both suffered from famine and were beset by fear on every side. While all were in deep despair, Agathocles, when he learned of the reverses in Libya, made ready seventeen warships intending to go to the aid of Archagathus. Although affairs in Sicily had also shifted to his disadvantage because of the increase in the strength of the exiles who followed Deonocrates, he entrusted the war on the island to Leptons as general, and he himself, manning his ships, watched for a chance to set sail, since the Carthaginians were blockading the harbour with thirty ships. Now at this very time eighteen ships arrived from Etruria as a reinforcement for him, slipping into the harbour at night without the knowledge of the Carthaginians. Gaining this resource, Agathocles outgeneraled his enemies, ordering the allies to remain until he should have sailed out and drawn the Carthaginians into the chase, he himself, just as he had planned, put to sea from the harbour at top speed with his seventeen ships. The ships on guard pursued, but Agathocles, on seeing the Etruscans appearing from the harbour, suddenly turned his ships, took position for ramming, and pitted his ships against the barbarians. The Carthaginians, terror-stricken by the surprise and because their own triremes were cut off between the enemy fleets, fled. Thereupon the Greeks captured five ships with their crews, and the commander of the Carthaginians, when his flagship was on the point of being captured, killed himself, preferring death to the anticipated captivity. But in truth he was shown by the event to have judged unwisely, for his ship caught a favoring wind, raised its jury mast and fled from the battle. Agathocles, who had no hope of ever getting the better of the Carthaginians on the sea, unexpectedly defeated them in a naval battle, and thereafter he ruled the sea and gave security to his merchants. For this reason the people of Syracuse, goods being brought to them from all sides, in place of scarcity of provisions soon enjoyed an abundance of everything. The tyrant, encouraged by the success that had been won, dispatched leptons to plunder the country of the enemy and, in particular, that of Acragas. For Xenoticus, vilified by his political opponents because of the defeat he had suffered, was at strife with them. Agathocles therefore ordered Leptons to try to entice the man out to a battle, for, he said, it would be easy to defeat him since his army was seditious and had already been overcome. 
And indeed this was accomplished, for when Leptons entered the territory of Akragas and began plundering the land, Xenoticus at first kept quiet, not believing himself strong enough for battle, but when he was reproached by the citizens for cowardice, he led out his army, which in number fell little short of that of his opponents, but in morale was far inferior since the citizen army had been formed amid indulgence and a sheltered way of life and the other had been trained in military service. In the field and in constant campaigns. Therefore when battle was joined, Leptons quickly routed the men of Akragas and pursued them into the city, and there fell in the battle on the side of the vanquished about five hundred foot soldiers and more than fifty horsemen. Then the people of Akragas, vexed over their disasters, brought charges against Xenoticus, saying that because of him they had twice been defeated, but he, fearing the impending investigation and trial, departed to Jela. Agathocles, having within a few days defeated his enemies both on land and sea, sacrificed to the gods and gave lavish entertainments for his friends. In his drinking bouts he used to put off the pomp of tyranny and to show himself more humble than the ordinary citizens, and by seeking through a policy of this sort the goodwill of the multitude and at the same time giving men license to speak against him in their cups he used to discover exactly the opinion of each, since through wine the truth is brought to light without concealment but by nature also a buffoon and a mimic, not even in the meetings of the assembly did he abstain from jeering at those who were present and from portraying certain of them, so that the common people would often break out into laughter as if they were watching one of the impersonators or conjurers. With a crowd serving as his bodyguard, he used to enter the assembly unattended, unlike Dionysius the tyrant. For the latter was so distrustful of one and all that as a rule, he let his hair and beard grow long so that he need not submit the most vital parts of his body to the steel of the barber, and if ever it became necessary for him to have his head trimmed, he singed off the locks, declaring that the only safety of a tyrant was distrust. Now Agathocles at the drinking bout, taking a great golden cup, said that he had not given up the potter's craft until in his pursuit of art he had produced in pottery beakers of such workmanship as this for he did not deny his trade but on the contrary used to boast of it, claiming that it was by his own ability that in place of the most lowly position in life he had secured the most exalted one. Once when he was besieging a certain not inglorious city and people from the wall shouted, Potter and Furnace Man, when will you pay your soldiers, he said in a way, when I have taken the city. Nonetheless, however, when through the jesting at drinking bouts he had discovered which of those who were flushed with wine were hostile to his tyranny he invited them individually on another occasion to a banquet, and also those of the other Syracusans who had become particularly presumptuous, in number about five hundred, and surrounding them with suitable men from his mercenaries he slaughtered them all. For he was taking very careful precautions lest, while he was absent in Libya, they should overthrow the tyranny and recall Deinocrates and the exiles. After he had made his rule secure in this way, he sailed from Syracuse. When he arrived in Libya he found the army discouraged and in great want, deciding, therefore, that it was best to fight a battle, he encouraged the soldiers for the fray and, after leading forth the army in battle array, challenged the barbarians to combat. As infantry he had all the surviving Greeks, six thousand in number, at least as many Celts, Samnites, and Etruscans, and almost ten thousand Libyans, who, as it turned out, only sat and looked on, being always ready to change with changing conditions. In addition to these, there followed him fifteen hundred horsemen and more than six thousand Libyan chariots. The Carthaginians, since they were encamped in high and inaccessible positions, decided not to risk a battle against men who had no thought of safety, but they hoped that, by remaining in their camp where they were plentifully supplied with everything, they would defeat their enemy by famine and the passage of time. But Agathocles, since he could not lure them down to the plain and since his own situation forced him to do something daring and chance the result, led his army against the encampment of the barbarians. Then when the Carthaginians came out against him, even though they were far superior in number and had the advantage of the rough terrain, Agathocles held out for some time although hard pressed on every side, but afterwards, when his mercenaries and the others began to give way, he was forced to withdraw toward his camp. The barbarians, as they pressed forward stoutly, passed by the Libyans without molesting them in order to elicit their goodwill, but recognizing the Greeks and the mercenaries by their weapons, they continued to slay them until they had driven them into their own camp. Now on this occasion about three thousand of Agathocles' men were killed, but on the following night it so happened that each army was visited by a strange and totally unexpected mishap. 
while the Carthaginians after their victory were sacrificing the fairest of their captives as thank offerings to the gods by night, and while a great blaze enveloped the men who were being offered as victims, a sudden blast of wind struck them, with the result that the sacred hut, which was near the altar, caught fire, and from this the hut of the general caught and then the huts of the leaders, which were in line with it, so that great consternation and fear sprang up throughout the whole camp. Some were trapped by the conflagration while trying to put out the fire and others while carrying out their armor and the most valued of their possessions, for, since the huts were made of reeds and straw and the fire was forcibly fanned by the breeze, the aid brought by the soldiers came too late. Thus when almost the entire camp was in flames, many, caught in the passages which were narrow, were burned alive and suffered due punishment on the spot for their cruelty to the captives, the impious act itself having brought about a punishment to match it, and as for those who dashed from the camp amid tumult and shouting, another greater danger awaited them. As many as five thousand of the Libyans who had been taken into Agathocles' army had deserted the Greeks and were going over by night to the barbarians. When those who had been sent out as scouts saw these men coming toward the Carthaginian camp, believing that the whole army of the Greeks was advancing ready for battle, they quickly reported the approaching force to their fellow soldiers. When the report had been spread through the whole force, there arose tumult and dread of the enemy's attack. Each man placed his hope of safety in flight, and since no order had been given by the commanders nor was there any formation, the fugitives kept running into each other. When some of them failed to recognize their friends because of the darkness and others because of fright, they fought against them as if they were enemies. A general slaughter took place, and while the misunderstanding still prevailed, some were slain in hand-to-hand -hand fighting and others, who had sped away unarmed and were fleeing through the rough country, fell from cliffs, distraught in mind by the sudden panic. Finally after more than five thousand had perished, the rest of the multitude came safe to Carthage. But those in the city, who had also been deceived at that time by the report of their own people, supposed that they had been conquered in a battle and that the largest part of the army had been destroyed. Therefore in great anxiety they opened the city gates and with tumult and excitement received their soldiers, fearing lest with the last of them the enemy should burst in. When day broke, however, they learned the truth and were with difficulty freed from their expectation of disaster. At this same time, however, Agathocles by reason of deceit and mistaken expectation met with similar disaster. For the Libyans who had deserted did not dare go on after the burning of the camp and the tumult that had arisen, but turned back again, and some of the Greeks, seeing them advancing and believing that the army of the Carthaginians had come, reported to Agathocles that the enemy's forces were near at hand. The Dynas gave the order to take up arms, and the soldiers rushed from the camp with great tumult. Since at the same time the fire in the Carthaginian camp blazed high and the shouting of the Carthaginians became audible, the Greeks believed that the barbarians were in very truth advancing against them with their whole army. Since their consternation prevented deliberation, panic fell upon the camp and all began to flee. Then as the Libyans mingled with them and the darkness fostered and increased their uncertainty, those who happened to meet fought each other as if they were enemies. They were scattered about everywhere throughout the whole night and were in the grip of panic fear, with the result that more than four thousand were killed. When the truth was at long last discovered, those who survived returned to their camp. Thus both armies met with disaster in the way described, being tricked, according to the proverb, by the empty alarms of war. Since after this misfortune the Libyans all deserted him and the army which remained was not strong enough to wage battle against the Carthaginians, Agathocles decided to leave Libya. But he did not believe that he would be able to transport his soldiers since he had not prepared any transports and the Carthaginians would never permit it while they controlled the sea. He did not expect that the barbarians would agree to a truce because they were far superior in their armies and were determined by the destruction of those who had first come across to prevent others from attacking Libya. He decided, therefore, to make the return voyage with a few in secret, and he took on board with him the younger of his sons, Heracleides, for he was on his guard against Archagathus, lest some time the son, who was on intimate terms with his stepmother and was bold by nature, should form a conspiracy against himself. Archagathus, however, suspecting his purpose watched for the sailing with care, being determined to reveal the plot to such of the leaders as would prevent the attempt, for he thought it monstrous that, although he had shared willingly in the battles, fighting in behalf of his father and brother, yet he alone should be deprived of a safe return and left behind as a victim to the enemy. He therefore disclosed to some of the leaders that Agathocles was about to sail away in secret by night. 
These coming quickly together not only prevented this, but also revealed Agathocles' knavery to the rank and file, and the soldiers, becoming furious at this, seized the tyrant, bound him, and put him in custody. Consequently, when discipline disappeared in the camp, there was tumult and confusion, and as night came on word was spread abroad that the enemy was near. When fright and panic fear fell upon them, each man armed himself and rushed forth from the encampment, no men giving orders. At this very time those who were guarding the tyrant, being no less frightened than the others and imagining that they were being summoned by somebody, hastily brought out Agathocles bound with chains. When the common soldiers saw him, they were moved to pity and all shouted to let him go. When released, he embarked on the transport with a few followers and secretly sailed away, although this was in the winter at the season of the setting of the Pleiades. This man, then, concerned about his own safety, abandoned his sons, whom the soldiers among other things slew when they learned of his escape, and the soldiers selected generals from their own number and made peace with the Carthaginians on these terms, they were to give back the cities which they held and to receive three hundred talents, and those who chose to serve with the Carthaginians were to receive pay at the regular rates, and the others, when transported to Sicily, were to receive solace as a dwelling place. Now, most of the soldiers abided by the terms and received what had been agreed upon, but all those who continued to occupy the cities because they still clung to hopes of Agathocles were attacked and taken by storm. Their leaders the Carthaginians crucified, the others they bound with fetters and forced them by their own labor to bring back again into cultivation the country they had laid waste during the war. In this way, then, the Carthaginians recovered the liberty in the fourth year of the war. One might well draw attention both to the almost incredible elements in Agathocles' expedition to Libya and to the punishment that befell his children as if by divine providence. For although in Sicily he had been defeated and had lost the largest part of his army, in Libya with a small portion of his forces he defeated those who had previously been victorious. And after he had lost all the cities in Sicily, he was besieged at Syracuse, but in Libya, after becoming master of all the other cities, he confined the Carthaginians by a siege, fortune, as if of set purpose, displaying her peculiar power when a situation has become hopeless. After he had come to such a position of superiority and had murdered Ophelas although he was a friend and a guest, the divine power clearly showed that it established through his impious acts against Ophelas a portent of that which later befell him, for in the same month and on the same day on which he murdered Ophelas and took his army, he caused the death of his own sons and lost his own army. And what is most peculiar of all, the god like a good lawgiver exacted a double punishment from him, for when he had unjustly slain one friend, he was deprived of two sons, those who had been with Ophelas laying violent hands upon the young men. Let these things, then, be said as our answer to those who scorn such matters. When with all speed Agathocles had crossed from Libya into Sicily, he summoned a part of his army and went to the city of Segesta, which was an ally. Because he was in need of money, he forced the well-to-do to deliver to him the greater part of their property, the city at that time having a population of about 10,000. Since many were angry at this and were holding meetings, he charged the people of Segesta with conspiring against him and visited the city with terrible disasters. For instance, the poorest of the people he brought to a place outside the city beside the river Scamander and slaughtered them, but those who were believed to have more property he examined under torture and compelled each to tell him how much wealth he had, and some of them he broke on the wheel, others he placed bound in the catapults and shot forth, and by applying knuckle bones with violence to some, he caused them severe pain. He also invented another torture similar to the bull of Phalaris, that is, he prepared a brazen bed that had the form of a human body and was surrounded on every side by bars, on this he fixed those who were being tortured and roasted them alive, the contrivance being superior to the bull in this respect, that those who perishing in anguish were visible. As for the wealthy women, he tortured some of them by crushing their ankles with iron pincers, he cut off the breasts of others, and by placing bricks on the lower part of the backs of those who were pregnant, he forced the expulsion of the fetus by the pressure. While the tyrant in this way was seeking all the wealth, great panic prevailed throughout the city, some burning themselves up along with their houses, and others gaining release from life by hanging. Thus Segesta, encountering a single day of disaster, suffered the loss of all her men from youth upward. Agathocles then took the maidens and children across to Italy and sold them to the Bredians, leaving not even the name of the city, but he changed the name to Dikeopolis and gave it as dwelling to the deserters. 
On hearing of the murder of his sons Agathocles became enraged at all those who had been left behind in Libya and sent some of his friends into Syracuse to entender his brother, ordering him to put to death all the relatives of those who had taken part in the campaign against Carthage. As Antander promptly carried out the order, there occurred the most elaborately devised massacre that had taken place up to this time, for not only did they drag out to death the brothers, fathers, and sons who were in the prime of manhood, but also the grandfathers, and even the fathers of these if such survived, men who lingered on an extreme old age and were already bereft of all their senses by lapse of time, as well as infant children born in arms who had no consciousness whatever of the fate that was bearing down upon them. They also led away any women who were related by marriage or kinship, and in some, every person whose punishment would bring grief to those who had been left in Libya. When a crowd, large and composed of all kinds of people, had been driven to the sea for punishment and when the executioners had taken their places beside them, weeping in prayers and wailing arose mingled together, as some of them were mercilessly slaughtered and others were stunned by the misfortunes of their neighbors and because of their own imminent fate were no better in spirit than those who were being put to death before them. And what was most cruel of all, when many had been slain and their bodies had been cast out along the shore, neither kinsman nor friend dared pay the last rites to any, fearing lest he should seem to inform on himself as one who enjoyed intimacy with those who were dead. And because of the multitude of those who had been slain beside its waves, the sea, stained with blood over a great expanse, proclaimed afar the unequalled savagery of this outrage. When this year had passed, Caribus became archon in Athens, and in Rome Quintus Martius and Publius Cornelius succeeded to the consulship. While these held office King Antigonus, the younger of whose sons, Phoenix, had died, buried this son with royal honors, and, after summoning Demetrius from Cyprus, he collected his forces in Antigonia. He had decided to make a campaign against Egypt. So he himself took command of the land army and advanced through Coil Syria with more than 80,000 foot soldiers, about 8,000 horsemen, and 83 elephants. Giving the fleet to Demetrius, he ordered him to follow along the coast in contact with the army as it advanced. In all, there had been made ready 150 warships and 100 transports in which a large stock of ordnance was being conveyed. When the pilots thought it necessary to heed the setting of the Pleiades, which was expected to take place after eight days, Antigonus censured them as men afraid of danger, but he himself, since he was encamped at Gaza and was eager to forestall the preparations of Ptolemy, ordered his soldiers to provide themselves with ten days' rations and loaded on the camels, which had been gathered together by the Arabs, 130,000 measures of grain and a good stock of fodder for the beasts, and, carrying his ordnance in wagons, he advanced through the wilderness with great hardship because many places in the region were swampy, particularly near the spot called Barathra. As for Demetrius, after setting sail from Gaza about midnight, since the weather at first was calm for several days, he had his transports towed by the swifter ships, then the setting of the Pleiades overtook them and a north wind arose, so that many of the quadrireams were driven dangerously by the storm to Raphia, a city which affords no anchorage and is surrounded by shoals. Of the ships that were carrying his ordnance, some were overwhelmed by the storm and destroyed, and others ran back to Gaza, but pressing on with the strongest of the ships he held his course as far as Casium. This place is not very distant from the Nile, but it has no harbor and in the stormy season it is impossible to make a landing here. They were therefore compelled to cast their anchors and ride the waves at a distance of about two stades from the land, where they were at once encompassed by many dangers, for since the surf was breaking rather heavily, there was danger that the ships would founder with their crews, and since the shore was harborless and in enemy hands, the ships could neither approach without danger, nor could the men swim ashore, and what was worst of all, the water for drinking had given out and they were reduced to such straits that, if the storm had continued for a single day more, all would have perished of thirst. When all were in despair and already expecting death, the wind fell, and the army of Antigonus came up and camped near the fleet. They therefore left the ships and recuperated in the camp while waiting for those vessels that had become separated. In this exposure to the waves three of the quinquireams were lost, but some of the men from these swam to the shore. Then Antigonus led his army nearer to the Nile and camped at a distance of two stades b from the river. Ptolemy, who had occupied and advanced the most strategic points with trustworthy garrisons, sent men in small boats, ordering them to approach the landing place and proclaimed that he would pay a premium to any who deserted Antigonus, two minae to each of the ordinary soldiers and one talent to each man who had been assigned to a position of command. 
when proclamations to that effect had been made, an urge to change sides fell upon the mercenaries of Antigonus, and it transpired that many even of their officers were inclined for one reason or another to desire a change. But when many were going over to Ptolemy, Antigonus, stationing bowmen, slingers, and many of his catapults on the edge of the river, drove back those who were drawing near in their punts, and he captured some of the deserters and tortured them frightfully, wishing to intimidate any who were contemplating such an attempt as this. After adding to his force the ships that were late in arriving, he sailed to the place called Sedostamon, believing that he would be able to disembark some of the soldiers there. But when he found at that place a strong garrison and was held in check by bolts and other missiles of every kind, he sailed away as night was closing in. Then giving orders to the pilots to follow the ship of the general, keeping their eyes fixed on its light, he sailed to the mouth of the Nile called Fatniticum, but when day came, since many of the ships had missed their course, he was forced to wait for these and to send out the swiftest of those that had followed him to search for them. Since this caused considerable delay, Ptolemy, hearing of the arrival of the enemy, came quickly to reinforce his men and after drawing up his army, stationed it along the shore, but Demetrius, having failed to make this landing also and hearing that the adjacent coast was naturally fortified by swamps and marshes, retraced his course with his whole fleet. Then a strong north wind burst upon them and the billows rose high, and three of his quadrireums, and in the same way some of the transports were cast violently upon the land by the waves and came into the possession of Ptolemy, but the other ships, whose crews had kept them from the shore by main force, reached the camp of Antigonus in safety. Since Ptolemy, however, had already occupied every landing place along the river with strong guards, since many river boats had been made ready for him, and since all of these were equipped with ordnance of every kind and with men to use it, Antigonus was in no little difficulty, for his naval force was of no use to him since the Pelusiac mouth of the Nile had been occupied in advance by the enemy, and his land forces found their advance thwarted since they were checked by the width of the river, and what was of greatest importance, as many days had passed, food for the men and fodder for the beasts were falling short. Since, then, his forces for these reasons were disheartened, Antigonus called together the army and its leaders and laid before them the question whether it was better to remain and continue the war or to return for the present to Syria and later make a campaign with more complete preparation and at the time at which the Nile was supposed to be lowest. When all inclined toward the quickest possible withdrawal, he commanded the soldiers to break camp and speedily return to Syria, the whole fleet coasting along beside him. After the departure of the enemy, Ptolemy rejoiced greatly, and, when he had made a thank-offering to the gods, he entertained his friends lavishly. He also wrote to Seleucus, Lysimachus, and Cassander about his successes and about the large number of men who had deserted to him, and he himself, having finished the second struggle for Egypt and convinced that the country was his as a prize of war, returned to Alexandria. While these events were taking place, Dionysius, the tyrant of Heraclea Pontica, died after having ruled for thirty-two years, and his sons, Oxythras and Clearchus, succeeding to the tyranny, ruled for seventeen years. In Sicily Agathocles visited the cities that were subject to him, making them secure with garrisons and exacting money from them, for he was taking extreme precautions lest, because of the misfortunes that had befallen him, the Sicilian Greeks should make an effort to gain their independence. Indeed at that very time Pasiphilus the general, having heard of the murder of Agathocles' sons and of his reverses in Libya, regarded the tyrant with contempt, and, deserting to Deonocrates and establishing friendship with him, he both kept a firm grip on the cities which had been entrusted to him and by alluring the minds of his soldiers with hopes alienated them from the tyrant. Agathocles, now that his hopes were being curtailed in every quarter, was so cast down in spirit that he sent an embassy to Deonocrates and invited him to make a treaty on these terms, that, on the one hand, God should withdraw from his position as tyrant and restore Syracuse to its citizens, and Deonocrates should no longer be in exile, and that, on the other hand, there should be given to Agathocles two designated fortresses, Therma and Cephalidium, together with their territories. One might with good reason express wonder at this point that Agathocles, who had shown himself resolute in every other situation and had never lost confidence in himself when his prospects were at their lowest, at this time became a coward and without a fight abandoned to his enemies the tyranny for the sake of which he had previously fought many great battles, and what was the most unaccountable of all, that while he was master of Syracuse and of the other cities and had possession of ships and wealth and an army commensurate with these, he lost all power of calculating chances, recalling not one of the experiences of the tyrant Dionysius. 
For instance, when that tyrant had been driven into a situation that was confessedly desperate and when, because of the greatness of the impending dangers, he had given up hope of retaining his throne and was about to ride out from Syracuse into voluntary exile, Hilorus, the eldest of his friends, opposing his impulse, said, Dionysius, tyranny is a good winding sheet. And similarly his brother-in-law, Megacles, spoke his mind to Dionysius, saying that the man who was being expelled from a tyranny ought to make his exit dragged by the leg and not to depart of his own free choice. Encouraged by these exhortations, Dionysius firmly faced all the emergencies that seemed formidable and not only made his dominion greater, but when he himself had grown old amid its blessings, he left to his sons the greatest empire of Europe. Agathocles, however, buoyed up by no such consideration and failing to test his mortal hopes by experience, was on the point of abandoning his empire, great as it was, on these terms. But as it happened, the treaty never went into effect, ratified indeed by the policy of Agathocles, but not accepted because of the ambition of Deinocrates. The latter, having set his heart upon sole rule, was hostile to the democracy in Syracuse and was well pleased with the position of leadership that he himself then had, for he commanded more than 20,000 foot soldiers, 3,000 horsemen, and many great cities, so that, although he was called general of the exiles, he really possessed the authority of a king, his power being absolute. But if he should return to Syracuse, it would inevitably be his lot to be a private citizen and be numbered as one of the many, since independence loves equality, and in the elections he might be defeated by any chance demagogue, since the crowd is opposed to the supremacy of men who are outspoken. Thus Agathocles might justly be said to have deserted his post as tyrant, and Deinocrates might be regarded as responsible for the later successes of the dynast. For Deinocrates, when Agathocles kept sending embassies to discuss the terms of peace and begging him to grant the two fortresses in which he might end his days, always trumped up specious excuses by which he cut off any hope of a treaty, now insisting that Agathocles should leave Sicily, and now demanding his children as hostages. When Agathocles discovered his purpose, he sent to the exiles and accused Deinocrates of hindering them from gaining their independence, and to the Carthaginians he sent envoys and made peace with them on terms such that the Phoenicians should regain all the cities which had formerly been subject to them, and in return for them he received from the Carthaginians gold to the value of three hundred talents of silver, or, as Timaeus says, one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand measures of grain. And affairs in Sicily were in this condition. In Italy the Samnites took Sora and Calatia, cities that were allied to the Romans, and enslaved the inhabitants, and the consuls with strong armies invaded Iapygia and camped near Silvium. This city was garrisoned by the Samnites, and the Romans began a siege which lasted a considerable number of days. Capturing the city by storm, they took prisoner more than 5,000 persons and collected a considerable amount of booty besides. When they had finished with this, they invaded the country of the Samnites, cutting down the trees and destroying every district. For the Romans, who had for many years been fighting the Samnites for the primacy, hoped that if they deprived the enemy of their property in the country, it would force them to submit to the stronger. For this reason they devoted five months to the ruining of the enemy's land, and they burned nearly all the farm buildings and laid waste the land, destroying everything that could produce cultivated fruit. Thereafter, they declared war on the Anagnati, who were acting unjustly, and taking for Zeno they distributed the land. When this year had passed, Euxenippus became archon in Athens, and in Rome Lucius Postumius and Tiberius Minucius were consuls. While these held office war arose between the Rhodians and Antigonus for some such reasons as these. The city of the Rhodians, which was strong in sea power and was the best governed city of the Greeks, was a prize eagerly sought after by the dynasts and kings, each of them striving to add her to his alliance. Seeing far in advance what was advantageous and establishing friendship with each of the dynasts separately, Rhodes took no part in their wars with each other. As a result, she was honored by each of them with regal gifts and, while enjoying peace for a long time, made great steps forward. In fact she advanced to such strength that in behalf of the Greeks she by herself undertook her war against the pirates and purged the seas of these evildoers, and Alexander, the most powerful of men known to memory, honoring Rhodes above all cities, both deposited there the testament disposing of his whole realm and in other ways showed admiration for her and promoted her to a commanding position. 
At any rate, the Rhodians, having established packs of friendship with all the rulers, carefully avoided giving legitimate grounds for complaint, but in displaying goodwill they inclined chiefly toward Ptolemy, for it happened that most of their revenues were due to the merchants who sailed to Egypt, and that in general the city drew its food supply from that kingdom. Because Antigonus knew this and was intent on separating the Rhodians from their connection with Ptolemy, he first sent out envoys to them at the time when he was fighting with Ptolemy for Cyprus and asked him to ally themselves with him and to dispatch ships in company with Demetrius, and when they did not consent, he dispatched one of his generals with ships, ordering him to bring to land any merchants sailing to Egypt from Rhodes and to seize their cargoes. When this general was driven off by the Rhodians, Antigonus, declaring that they were authors of an unjust war, threatened to lay siege to the city with strong forces. The Rhodians, however, first voted great honors for him, and, sending envoys, they begged him not to force the city to rush into the war against Ptolemy, contrary to their treaties. But then, when the king answered rather harshly and sent his son Demetrius with an army and siege equipment, they were so frightened by the superior power of the king that at first they sent to Demetrius, saying that they would join Antigonus in the war with Ptolemy, but when Demetrius demanded as hostages a hundred of the noblest citizens and ordered also that his fleet should be received in their harbors, concluding that he was plotting against the city, they made ready for war. Demetrius, gathering all his forces in the harbor at Lorima, made his fleet ready for the attack on Rhodes. He had 200 warships of all sizes and more than 170 auxiliary vessels, on these were transported not quite 40,000 soldiers besides the cavalry and the pirates who were his allies. There was also an ample supply of ordnance of all sorts and a large provision of all the things necessary for a siege. In addition, there accompanied him almost a thousand privately owned ships, which belonged to those who were engaged in trade, for since the land of the Thracians had been unplundered for many years, there had gathered together from all quarters a host of those who were accustomed to consider the misfortunes of men at war a means of enriching themselves. And so Demetrius, having drawn up his fleet as if for a naval battle in a way to inspire panic, sent forward his warships, which had on their prows the catapults for bolts three spans in length, and he had the transports for men and horses follow, towed by the ships that used oarsmen, and last of all came also the cargo ships of the pirates and of the merchants and traders, which as we have already said, were exceedingly numerous, so that the whole space between the island and the opposite. Shore was seen to be filled with his vessels, which brought great fear and panic to those who were watching from the city. For the soldiers of the Rhodians, occupying their several positions on the walls, were awaiting the approach of the hostile fleet, and the old men and women were looking on from their homes, since the city is shaped like a theater, and all, being terror-stricken at the magnitude of the fleet and the gleam of the shining armor, were not a little anxious about the final outcome. Then Demetrius sailed to the island, and after disembarking his army, he took position near the city, setting up his camp out of range of missiles. He at once sent out fit and proper men from the pirates and others to plunder the island both by land and by sea. He also cut down the trees in the region nearby and destroyed the farm buildings, and with this material he fortified the camp, surrounding it with a triple palisade and with great, close-set stockades, so that the loss suffered by the enemy became a protection for his own men. After this, using the whole army and the crews, he in a few days closed with a mole of the space between the city and the exit, and made a port large enough for his ships. For a time, the Rhodians kept sending envoys and asking him to do nothing irreparable against the city, but as no one paid any heed to these, they gave up hope of a truce and sent envoys to Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Cassander, begging them to give aid and saying that the city was fighting the war on their behalf. As to the medics and aliens who dwelt in the city, to those who wished they gave permission to join them in the fighting and the others who were of no service they sent forth from the city, partly as a precaution against scarcity of supplies, and partly that there might be no one to become dissatisfied with the situation and try to betray the city. When they made account of those who were able to fight, they found that there were about six thousand citizens and as many as a thousand medics and aliens. They voted also to buy from their masters any slaves who proved themselves brave men in the battle and to emancipate and enfranchise them. And they also wrote another decree that the bodies of those who fell in the war should be given public burial and, further, that their parents and children should be maintained, receiving their support from the public treasury, that their unmarried daughters should be given dowries at the public cost, and that their sons on reaching manhood should be crowned in the theater at the Dionysia and given a full suit of armor. When by these measures they had roused the spirits of all to endure the battles with courage, they also made what preparation was possible in regard to other matters. 
Since the whole people was of one mind, the rich contributed money, the craftsmen gave their skilled services for the preparation of the arms, and every man was active, each striving in a spirit of rivalry to surpass the others. Consequently, some were busy with the catapults and ballistae, others with the preparation of other equipment, some were repairing any ruined portions of the walls, and very many were carrying stones to the walls and stacking them. They even sent out three of their swiftest ships against the enemy and the merchant ships which brought provisions to him. These ships on appearing unexpectedly sank many vessels belonging to merchants who had sailed for the purpose of plundering the land for their own profit and even hauled not a few ships up on the beach and burned them. As for the prisoners, those who could pay a ransom they took into the city, for the Rhodians had made an agreement with Demetrius that each should pay the other a thousand drachmae as ransom for a free man and five hundred for a slave. Demetrius, who had an ample supply of everything required for setting up his engines of war, began to prepare two penthouses, one for the ballistae, the other for the catapults, each of them firmly mounted on two cargo vessels fastened together, and two towers of four stories, exceeding in height the towers of the harbour. Each of them mounted upon two ships of the same size and fastened there in such a way that as the towers advanced the support on each side upheld an equal weight. He also prepared a floating boom of squared logs studded with spikes, in order that as this was floated forward it might prevent the enemy from sailing up and ramming the ships that were carrying the engines of war. In the interval while these were receiving their finishing touches, he collected the strongest of the light craft, fortified them with planks, provided them with ports that could be closed, and placed upon them those of the catapults for bolts three palms long which had the longest range and the men to work them properly, and also Cretan archers, then, sending the boats within range. He shot down the men of the city who were building higher the walls along the harbour. When the Rhodians saw that the entire attack of Demetrius was aimed against the harbour, they themselves also took measures for its security. They placed two machines on the mole and three upon freighters near the boom of the small harbour, in these they mounted a large number of catapults and ballistae of all sizes, in order that if the enemy should disembark soldiers on the mole or should advance his machines, he might be thwarted in his design by this means. They also placed on such cargo ships as were at anchor in the harbour platforms suitable for the catapults that were to be mounted on them. After both sides had made their preparations in this way, Demetrius at first endeavoured to bring his engines of war against the harbour, but he was prevented when too rough a sea arose, later on, however, taking advantage of calm weather at night, he sailed in secretly, and after seizing the end of the mole of the great harbour he at once fortified the place, cutting it off with walls of planks and stones and landed there four hundred soldiers and a supply of ordnance of all kinds. This point was five plethora distant from the city walls. Then at daybreak he brought his engines into the harbour with the sound of trumpets and with shouts, and with the lighter catapults, which had a long range, he drove back those who were constructing the wall along the harbour, and with the ballista he shook or destroyed the engines of the enemy and the wall across the mall, for it was weak and low at this time. But since those from the city also fought stoutly, during that whole day both sides continued to inflict and suffer severe losses, and when night was already closing in, Demetrius by means of towboats drew his engines back out of range. The Rhodians, however, filled light boats with dry pitchy wood and placed fire in them, at first they went in pursuit and, drawing near to the engines of the enemy, lighted the wood, but afterwards, repelled by the floating boom and by the missiles, they were forced to withdraw. As the fire gained force a few put it out and sailed back with their boats, but most of them plunged into the sea as their boats were consumed. On the following day Demetrius made a similar attack by sea, but he also gave orders to assail the city at the same time by land from all sides with shouts and sound of trumpet in order to throw the Rhodians into an agony of terror because of the many distractions. After carrying on this kind of siege warfare for eight days, Demetrius shattered the engines of war upon the mole by means of his heavy ballistae and weakened the curtain of the cross wall together with the towers themselves. Some of his soldiers also occupied a part of the fortifications along the harbour, the Rhodians rallying their forces joined battle against these, and now that they outnumbered the enemy, they killed some and forced the rest to withdraw. The men of the city were aided by the ruggedness of the shore along the wall, for many large rocks lay close together beside the structure outside of the wall. Of the ships which had conveyed these soldiers no small number ran aground in their ignorance, and the Rhodians at once, after stripping off the beaks, threw dry pitchy wood into the ships and burned them. While the Rhodians were so occupied, the soldiers of Demetrius sailing up on every side placed ladders against the walls and pressed on more strongly, and the troops who were attacking from the land also joined in the struggle from every side and raised the battle cry in unison. 
Then indeed, since many had recklessly risked their lives, and a good number had mounted the walls, a mighty battle arose, those on the outside trying to force their way in and those in the city coming to the defense with one accord. Finally, as the Rhodians contended furiously, some of the men who had mounted were thrown down and others were wounded and captured, among whom were some of their most distinguished leaders. Since such losses had befallen those who fought from the outside, Demetrius withdrew his engines of war to his own harbor and repaired the ships and engines that had been damaged, and the Rhodians buried those of their citizens who had perished, dedicated to the gods the arms of the enemy and the beaks of the ships, and rebuilt the parts of the wall that had been overthrown by the ballisti. After Demetrius had spent seven days on the repair of his engines and ships and had made all his preparations for the siege, he again attacked the harbor, for his whole effort centered upon capturing this and shutting off the people of the city from their grain supplies. When he was within range, with the fire arrows, of which he had many, he made an account on the ships of the Rhodians that lay at anchor, with his ballisti he shook the walls, and with his catapults he cut down any who showed themselves. Then when the attack had become continuous and terrifying, the Rhodian ship captains, after a fierce struggle to save their ships, put out the fire arrows, and the magistrates, since the harbor was in danger of being taken, summoned the noblest citizens to undergo the perils of war for the sake of the common safety. When many responded with alacrity, they manned the three staunchest ships with picked men, whom they instructed to try to sink with their rams the ships that carried the engines of the enemy. These men, accordingly, pushed forward although missiles in large numbers were speeding against them, and at first they broke through the iron-studded boom, and then by delivering repeated blows with their rams upon the ships and filling them with water, they overthrew two of the engines, but when the third was drawn back with ropes by the men of Demetrius, the Rhodians, encouraged by their successes, pressed on into the battle more boldly than was prudent. And so, when many large ships crowded around them and the sides of their own ships had been shattered in many places by the rams, the Admiral Exocestus, the Triarch, and some others were disabled by wounds and captured, and as the rest of its crew jumped into the sea and swam to their own fellows, one of the ships came into the possession of Demetrius, but the other ships escaped from the battle. When the naval battle had turned out in this way, Demetrius constructed another machine three times the size of the former in height and width, but while he was bringing this up to the harbor, a violent storm from the south sprang up, which swept over the ships that were anchored and overthrew the engine. And at this very time the Rhodians, shrewdly availing themselves of the situation, opened a gate and sallied out upon those who had occupied the mole. A severe battle ensued lasting for a long time, and since Demetrius could not send reinforcements because of the storm, and the Rhodians, on the other hand, were fighting in relays, the king's men were forced to lay down their arms and surrender, in number above four hundred. After the Rhodians had gained these advantages there sailed in as allies for the city one hundred and fifty soldiers from the Nations and more than five hundred from Ptolemy, some of whom were Rhodians serving as mercenaries in the king's army. This was the state of the Siege of Rhodes. In Sicily Agathocles, since he had been unable to make terms with Deinocrates and the exiles, took the field against them with what forces he had, believing that it was necessary for him to fight a battle with them and stake everything on the result. Not more than five thousand foot soldiers followed him and horsemen to the number of eight hundred. Deinocrates and the exiles, when they saw the move made by the enemy, gladly came out to meet him in battle, being many times as strong, for their foot soldiers came to more than twenty-five thousand and their cavalry to not less than three thousand. When the armies had encamped opposite each other near the place called Torgium, and then were drawn up against each other in battle array, for a short time there was a stubborn battle because of the eagerness of both sides, but then some of those who were at odds with Deinocrates, more than two thousand in number, went over to the tyrant and were responsible for the defeat of the exiles. For those who were with Agathocles gained much more confidence, and those who were fighting on the side of Deinocrates were dismayed and, overestimating the number of the deserters, broke into flight. Then Agathocles, after pursuing them for a certain distance and refraining from slaughter, sent envoys to the defeated and asked them to put an end to the quarrel and return to their native cities, for, he said, they had found by experience that the exiles would never be able to prevail in a battle with him, seeing that even on this occasion, although they were many times more numerous, they had been defeated. Of the exiles, all the horsemen survived the fight and came safe into Amasi, but as for the foot soldiers, although some escaped when night came on, most of them after occupying a hill made terms with Agathocles, for they had lost hope of victory by fighting and longed for their relatives and friends, and for their fatherland and its comforts. 
Now when they had received pledges of good faith and had come down from the hill for it, such as it was, Agathocles took their arms, and then, stationing his army about them, he shot them all down, their number being about seven thousand, as Timaeus says, but as some have written, about four thousand. Indeed, this tyrant always scorned faith in his oaths, and he maintained his own power, not by the strength of his armed forces, but by the weakness of his subjects, fearing his allies more than his enemies. When he had destroyed in this manner the army that had been arrayed against him, Agathocles received any exiles who survived and, making terms with Deinocrates, appointed him general over part of his army and continued to entrust the most important matters to him. In this connection one might well wonder why Agathocles, who was suspicious of everyone and never completely trusted anybody, continued his friendship with Deinocrates alone until death. But Deinocrates, after betraying his allies, seized and slew Pasiphilus in Gela and handed the strongholds in the cities to Agathocles, spending two years in the delivery of the enemy. In Italy the Romans defeated the Peligni and took their land, and to some of those who seemed well disposed toward Rome, they granted citizenship. Thereafter, since the Samnites were plundering Falernitis, the consuls took the field against them, and in the battle that followed the Romans were victorious. They took twenty standards and made prisoners of more than two thousand soldiers. The consuls at once took the city of Bola, but Gellius Gaius, the leader of the Samnites, appeared with six thousand soldiers. A hard-fought battle took place in which Gellius himself was made prisoner, and of the other Samnites most were cut down but some were captured alive. The consuls, taking advantage of such victories, recovered those allied cities that had been captured, Sora, Harpina, and Serenia. When that year had passed, Pharacles became archon in Athens and in Rome Publius Sempronius and Publius Sulpicius received the consulship, and in Elis the Olympian Games were celebrated for the 119th time, at which celebration Andromenes of Corinth won the footrace. While these held office, Demetrius, who was besieging Rhodes, failing in his assaults by sea, decided to make his attacks by land. Having provided therefore a large quantity of material of all kinds, he built an engine called the Helepolis, which far surpassed in size those which had been constructed before it. Each side of the square platform he made almost fifty cubits in length, framed together from squared timber and fastened with iron, the space within he divided by bars set about a cubit from each other so that there might be standing space for those who were to push the machine forward. The whole structure was movable, mounted on eight great solid wheels, the width of their rims was two cubits, and these were overlaid with heavy iron plates. To permit motion to the side, pivots had been constructed, by means of which the whole device was easily moved in any direction. From each corner there extended upward beams equal in length and little short of a hundred cubits long, inclining toward each other in such a way that, the whole structure being nine stories high, the first story had an area of forty-three hundred square feet and the topmost story of nine hundred. The three exposed sides of the machine he covered externally with iron plates nailed on so that it should receive no injury from fire carriers. On each story there were ports on the front, in size and shape fitted to the individual characteristics of the missiles that were to be shot forth. These ports had shutters, which were lifted by a mechanical device and which secured the safety of the men on the platforms who were busy serving the artillery, for the shutters were of hides stitched together and were filled with wool so that they would yield to the blows of the stones from the ballistae. Each of the stories had two wide stairways, one of which they used for bringing up what was needed and the other for descending, in order that all might be taken care of without confusion. Those who were to move the machine were selected from the whole army, 3,400 men excelling in strength, some of them were enclosed within the machine while others were stationed in its rear, and they pushed it forward, the skillful design aiding greatly in its motion. He also constructed penthouses, some to protect the men who were filling the moat, others to carry rams, and covered passages through which those who were going to their labors might go and return safely. Using the crews of the ships, he cleared a space four stades wide through which he planned to advance the siege engines he had prepared, wide enough so that it covered a front of six curtains and seven towers. The number of craftsmen and laborers collected was not much less than thirty thousand. As everything, therefore, because of the many hands was finished sooner than was expected, Demetrius was regarded with alarm by the Rhodians, for not only did the size of the siege engines and the number of the army which had been gathered stun them, but also the king's energy and ingenuity in conducting sieges. For, being exceedingly ready in invention and devising many things beyond the art of the master builders, he was called Poliorcetes, and he displayed such superiority and force in his attacks that it seemed that no wall was strong enough to furnish safety from him for the besieged.
both in stature and in beauty he displayed the dignity of a hero, so that even those strangers who had come from a distance, when they beheld his comeliness arrayed in royal splendor, marveled at him and followed him as he went abroad in order to gaze at him. Furthermore, he was haughty in spirit and proud and looked down not only upon common men but also upon those of royal estate, and what was most peculiar to him, in time of peace he devoted his time to wine-bibbing and to drinking bouts accompanied by dancing and revels, and in general he emulated the conduct said by mythology to have been that of Dionysus among men, but in his wars he was active and sober, so that beyond all others who practiced this profession he devoted both body and mind to. The Task for it was in his time that the greatest weapons were perfected and engines of all kinds far surpassing those that had existed among others, and this man launched the greatest ships after the siege and after the death of his father. When the Rhodians saw the progress of the enemy siege works, they built a second wall inside parallel to the one that was on the point of failing under the attacks. They used stones obtained by tearing down the theater's outer wall and the adjacent houses, and also some of the temples, vowing to the gods that they would build finer ones when the city had been saved. They also sent out nine of their ships, giving the commanders orders to sail in every direction and, appearing unexpectedly, to sink some of the ships they intercepted and bring others to the city. After these had sailed out and had been divided into three groups, Demophilus, who had ships of the kind called by the Rhodians guard ships, sailed to Carpathos, and finding there many of Demetrius' ships, he sank some, shattering them with his rams, and some he beached and burnt after selecting the most useful men from their crews, and not a few of those that were transporting the grain from the island, he brought back to Rhodes. Menedemus, who commanded three light undecked ships, sailed to Padera in Lycia, and finding at anchor there a ship whose crew was on shore, he set the hull on fire, and he took many of the freighters that were carrying provisions to the army and dispatched them to Rhodes. He also captured a quadrireme that was sailing from Cilicia and had on board royal robes and the rest of the outfit that Demetrius' wife Philadelphia had with great pains made ready and sent off for her husband. The clothing Demophilus sent to Egypt since the garments were purple and proper for a king to wear, but the ship he hauled up on land, and he sold the sailors, both those from the quadrireme and those from the other captured ships. Amintas, who was in command of the three remaining ships, made for islands where he fell in with many freighters carrying to the enemy materials useful for the engines of war, he sank some of these and some he brought to the city. On these ships were also captured eleven famous engineers, men of outstanding skill in making missiles and catapults. Thereafter, when an assembly had been convened, some advised that the statues of Antigonus and Demetrius should be pulled down, saying that it was absurd to honor equally their besiegers and their benefactors. At this the people were angry and censured these men as erring, and they altered none of the honors awarded to Antigonus, having made a wise decision with a view both to fame and to self-interest. For the magnanimity and the soundness of this action in a democracy one plaudits from all others and repentance from the besiegers, for while the latter were setting free the cities throughout Greece, which had displayed no goodwill at all toward their benefactors, they were manifestly trying to enslave the city that in practice showed itself most constant in repaying favors, and as protection against the sudden shift of fortune if the war should result in the capture of Rhodes, the Rhodians. Retained as a means of gaining mercy the memory of the friendship that they had preserved. These things, then, were done prudently by the Rhodians. When Demetrius had undermined the wall by using his sappers, one of the deserters informed the besieged that those who were working underground were almost within the walls. Therefore the Rhodians, by digging a deep trench parallel to the wall which was expected to collapse and by quickly undertaking mining operations themselves, made contact with their opponents underground and prevented them from advancing farther. Now the mines were closely watched by both sides, and some of Demetrius' men tried to bribe Athenagoras, who had been given command of the guard by the Rhodians. This man was a Milesian by descent, sent by Ptolemy as commander of the mercenaries. Promising to turn traitor he set a day on which one of the ranking leaders should be sent from Demetrius to go by night through the mine up into the city in order to inspect the position where the soldiers would assemble. But after leading Demetrius on to great hopes, he disclosed the matter to the council, and when the king sent one of his friends, Alexander the Macedonian, the Rhodians captured him as he came up through the mine. They crowned Athenagoras with a golden crown and gave him a gift of five talents of silver, their object being to stimulate loyalty to the city on the part of the other men who were mercenaries and foreigners. Demetrius, when his engines of war were completed and all the space before walls was cleared, stationed the Helepolis in the center and assigned positions to the penthouses, eight in number, which were to protect the sappers. 
He placed four of these on each side of the Helepolis and connected with each of them one covered passage so that the men who were going in and out might accomplish their assigned tasks in safety, and he brought up also two enormous penthouses in which battering rams were mounted. For each shed held a ram with a length of 120 cubits, sheathed with iron and striking a blow like that of a ship's ram, and the ram was moved with ease, being mounted on wheels and receiving its motive power in battle from not less than a thousand men. When he was ready to advance the engines against the walls, he placed on each story of the Helepolis ballistae and catapults of appropriate size, stationed his fleet in position to attack the harbors and the adjacent area, and distributed his infantry along such parts of the wall as could be attacked. Then, when all at a single command and signal had raised the battle cry together, he launched attacks on the city from every side. While he was shaking the walls with the rams and the ballistae, Nidian envoys arrived, asking him to withhold his attack and promising to persuade the Rhodians to accept the most feasible of his demands. The king broke off the attack, and the envoys carried on negotiations back and forth at great length, but in the end they were not able to reach any agreement, and the siege was actively resumed. Demetrius also overthrew the strongest of the towers, which was built of squared stones, and shattered the entire curtain, so that the forces in the city were not able to maintain a thoroughfare on the battlements at this point. At this same period, King Ptolemy dispatched to the Rhodians a large number of supply ships in which were 300,000 measures of grain and legumes. While these ships were on their way to the city, Demetrius attempted to dispatch ships to bring them to his own camp. But a wind favorable to the Egyptians sprang up, and they were carried along with full sails and brought into the friendly harbors, but those sent out by Demetrius returned with their mission unaccomplished. Cassander also sent to the Rhodians 10,000 measures of barley, and Lysimachus sent them 40,000 measures of wheat and the same amount of barley. Consequently, when those in the city obtained such large supplies, the besieged, who were already disheartened, regained their courage. Deciding that it would be advantageous to attack the siege engines of the enemy, they made ready a large supply of fire-bearing missiles and placed all their ballistae and catapults upon the wall. When night had fallen, at about the second watch, they suddenly began to strike the Helepolis with an unremitting shower of the fire missiles, and by using other missiles of all kinds, they shot down any who rushed to the spot. Since the attack was unforeseen, Demetrius, alarmed for the siege works that had been constructed, hurried to the rescue. The night was moonless, and the fire missiles shone bright as they hurtled violently through the air, but the catapults and ballistae, since their missiles were invisible, destroyed many who were not able to see the impending stroke. It also happened that some of the iron plates of the Helepolis were dislodged, and where the place was laid bare the fire missiles rained upon the exposed wood of the structure. Therefore Demetrius, fearing that the fire would spread and the whole machine be ruined, came quickly to the rescue, and with the water that had been placed in readiness on the platforms he tried to put out the spreading fire. He finally assembled by a trumpet signal the men who were assigned to move the apparatus and by their efforts dragged the machine beyond range. Then when day had dawned he ordered the camp followers to collect the missiles that had been hurled by the Rhodians, since he wished to estimate from these the armament of the forces within the city. Quickly carrying out his orders, they counted more than 800 fire missiles of various sizes and not less than 1,500 catapult bolts. Since so many missiles had been hurled in a short time at night, he marveled at the resources possessed by the city and at their prodigality in the use of these weapons. Next Demetrius repaired such of his works as had been damaged and devoted himself to the burial of the dead and the care of the wounded. Meanwhile the people of the city, having gained a respite from the violent attacks of the siege engines, constructed a third crescent-shaped wall and included in its circuit every part of the wall that was in a dangerous condition, but nonetheless they dug a deep moat around the fallen portion of the wall so that the king should not be able to break into the city easily by an assault with a heavily armed force. They also sent out some of their fastest ships, installing Amintas as commander, he, sailing to Praia in Asia, suddenly confronted some pirates who had been sent out by Demetrius. These had three deckless ships and were supposed to be the strongest of the pirates who were fighting as allies of the king. In the brief naval battle that ensued, the Rhodians overpowered the foe and took the ships with their crews, among whom was Timicles, the chief pirate. They also encountered some of the merchants and, seizing a fair number of light craft loaded with grain, they sent these and the undecked ships of the pirates to harbor in Rhodes by night, escaping the notice of the enemy. Demetrius, after he had repaired such of his equipment as was damaged, brought his siege engines up to the wall. 
By using all his missiles without stint, he drove back those who were stationed on the battlements, and striking with his rams a continuous portion of the wall, he overthrew two curtains, but as the city's forces fought obstinately for the tower that was between them, there were bitter and continuous encounters, one after another, with the result that their leader Ananias was killed fighting desperately and many of the soldiers were slain also. While these events were taking place, King Ptolemy sent to the Rhodians grain and other supplies in no less quantity than those formerly sent, and 1,500 soldiers, whose leader was Antigonus, the Macedonian. At this very time, there came to Demetrius more than 50 envoys from the Athenians and the other Greek cities, all of them asking the king to come to terms with the Rhodians. A truce, therefore, was made, but although many arguments of all sorts were presented to the city and to Demetrius, they could in no way agree, and so the envoys returned without accomplishing their aim. Demetrius, having determined to attack the city at night through the breach in the wall, selected the strongest of his fighting men and of the rest those fitted for his purpose to the number of fifteen hundred. These, then, he ordered to advance to the wall in silence during the second watch, as for himself, when he had made his preparations, he gave orders to those stationed on each side that when he gave the signal, they should raise the battle cry and make attacks both by land and sea. When they all carried out the order, those who had advanced against breaches in the walls, after dispatching the advance guards at the moat, charged past into the city and occupied the region of the theatre, but the magistrates of the Rhodians, learning what had happened and seeing that the whole city had been thrown into confusion, sent orders to those at the harbour and the walls to remain at their own posts and oppose the enemy outside if he should attack, and they themselves, with their Contingent of selected men and the soldiers who had recently sailed in from Alexandria attacked the troops who had got within the walls. When day returned and Demetrius raised the ensign, those who were attacking the port and those who had been stationed about the while on all sides shouted the battle cry, giving encouragement to the men who had occupied part of the region of the theatre, but in the city the throng of children and women were in fear and tears, thinking that their native city was being taken by storm. Nevertheless, fighting began between those who had made their way within the wall and the Rhodians, and many fell on both sides. At first neither side withdrew from its position, but afterwards, as the Rhodians constantly added to their numbers and were prompt to face danger, as is the way with men fighting for their native land and their most precious things, and on the other hand the king's men were in distress, Alcimus and Mantias, their commanders, expired after receiving many wounds, most of the others were killed in hand-to-hand -hand fighting or were captured and only a few escaped to the king and survived. Many also of the Rhodians were slain, among whom was the president Damatiles, who had won great acclaim for his valor. When Demetrius realized that fortune had snatched from his hands the capture of the city, he made new preparations for the siege. When his father thereafter wrote to him to come to terms with the Rhodians as best he could, he awaited a favorable opportunity that would provide a specious excuse for the settlement. Since Ptolemy had written to the Rhodians, first saying that he would send them a great quantity of grain and three thousand soldiers, but then advising them, if it should be possible, to make equitable terms with Antigonus, everyone inclined toward peace. At just this time the Aetolian League sent envoys to urge a settlement, and the Rhodians came to terms with Demetrius on these conditions, that the city should be autonomous and ungarrisoned and should enjoy its own revenue, that the Rhodians should be allies of Antigonus unless he should be at war with Ptolemy, and that they should give as hostages a hundred of their citizens whom Demetrius should select, those holding office being exempt. In this way, then, the Rhodians, after they had been besieged for a year, brought the war to an end. Those who had proved themselves brave men in the battles they honored with the prizes that were their due, and they granted freedom and citizenship to such slaves as had shown themselves courageous. They also set up statues of King Cassander and King Lysimachus, who though they held second place in general opinion, yet had made great contributions to the salvation of the city. In the case of Ptolemy, since they wanted to surpass his record by repaying his kindness with a greater one, they sent a sacred mission into Libya to ask the oracle at Ammon if it advised the Rhodians to honor Ptolemy as a god. Since the oracle approved, they dedicated in the city a square precinct, building on each of its sides a portico a stade long, and this they called the Ptolemyum. They also rebuilt the theater, the fallen portions of the walls, and the buildings that had been destroyed in the other quarters in a manner more beautiful than before. Now that Demetrius, in accordance with injunctions of his father, had made peace with the Rhodians, he sailed out with his whole force, and after passing through the islands, he put in at Aulis in Boeotia. 
since he was intent on freeing the Greeks, for Cassander and Polyperkin having up to this time enjoyed impunity were engaged in plundering the greater part of Greece, he first freed the city of the Chalcidians, which was garrisoned by Boeotians, and by striking fear into the Boeotians, he forced them to renounce their friendship with Cassander. And after this he made an alliance with the Aetolians and began his preparations for carrying on war against Polyperkin and Cassander. While these events were taking place, Eumelus, the king of Bosporus, died in the sixth year of his reign, and his son Spartacus succeeded to the throne and reigned for twenty years. Now that we have carefully passed in review the happenings in Greece and Asia, we shall turn our narrative toward the other parts of the inhabited world. In Sicily, although the inhabitants of the Liparian Islands were at peace with him, Agathocles sailed against them without warning and exacted from men who had done him no prior injury whatever, fifty talents of silver. To many, indeed, what I am about to relate seemed the work of a god, since his crime received its brand from the divinity. When the Liparians begged him to grant them time for what was lacking in the payment and said that they had never turned the sacred offerings to profane uses, Agathocles forced them to give him the dedications in the Prytaneum, of which some bore inscriptions to Aeolus and some to Hephaestus, and taking these he at once sailed away. But a wind came up and the eleven of his ships that were carrying the money were sunk. And so it seemed to many that the god who was said in that region to be master of the winds at once on his first voyage exacted punishment from him, and that at the end Hephaestus punished him in his own country in a way that matched the tyrant's impious actions and the god's own name by burning him alive on hot coals. For it belonged to the same character and the same justice to refrain from touching those who were saving their own parents on Etna, and with his proper power to search after those who had been guilty of impiety toward his shrine. However, as regards the disaster that befell Agathocles, when we come to the proper time, the action itself will confirm what we now have said, but we must now tell of events in the adjacent parts of Italy. The Romans and the Samnites interchanged envoys and made peace after having fought for twenty-two years and six months, and one of the consuls, Publius Sempronius, invading the country of the Ecli with an army, captured forty cities in a total of fifty days, and after forcing the entire tribe to submit to Rome, returned home and celebrated a triumph with great applause. The Roman people made alliances with the Marci, the Polygni, Degree and the Maricini. When the year had come to its end, Leo Stratus was archon in Athens, and in Rome the consuls were Servius Cornelius and Lucius Genutius. While these held office Demetrius proposed to carry on his war with Cassander and to free the Greeks, and first he planned to establish order in the affairs of Greece, for he believed that the freeing of the Greeks would bring him great honor, and at the same time he thought it necessary to wipe out Prepolos and the other leaders before attacking Cassander, and then to go on against Macedonia itself if Cassander did not march against him. Now the city of Sicyon was garrisoned by King Ptolemy's soldiers, commanded by a very distinguished general, Philip. Attacking the city suddenly by night, Demetrius broke his way inside the walls. Then the garrison fled to the Acropolis, but Demetrius took possession of the city and occupied the region between the houses and the Acropolis. While he hesitated to bring up his siege engines, the garrison in panic surrendered the Acropolis on terms and the men themselves sailed off to Egypt. After Demetrius had moved the people of Sicyon into their Acropolis, he destroyed the part of the city adjacent to the harbor, since its site was quite insecure, then, after he had assisted the common people of the city in building their houses and had re-established free government for them, he received divine honors from those whom he had benefited, for they called the city Demetrius, and they voted to celebrate sacrifices and public festivals and also games in his honor every year and to grant him the other honors of a founder. Time, however, whose continuity has been broken by changes of conditions, has invalidated these honors, but the people of Sicyon, having thus obtained a much better location, continue to live there down to our times. For the enclosed area of the Acropolis is level and of ample size, and it is surrounded on all sides by cliffs difficult to scale, so that on no side can engines of war be brought near, moreover, it has plenty of water by the aid of which they developed rich gardens, so that the king in his design seems to have made excellent provision both for comfort in time of peace and for safety in time of war. After Demetrius had settled the affairs of the people of Sicyon, he set out with his whole army for Corinth, which was held by Prepolos, a general of Cassander. At first, after he had been admitted at night by certain citizens through a postern gate, Demetrius gained possession of the city and its harbors. 
The garrison, however, fled, some to the place called Sisyphium, some to Acrocorinth, but he brought up engines of war to the fortifications and took Sisyphium by storm after suffering heavy losses. Then, when the men there fled to those who had occupied Acrocorinth, he intimidated them also and forced them to surrender the citadel, for this king was exceedingly irresistible in his assaults, being particularly skilled in the construction of siege equipment. Be that as it may, when once he had freed the Corinthians he brought a garrison into Acrocorinth, since the citizens wished the city to be protected by the king until the war with Cassander should be brought to an end. Prepolos, ignominiously driven out of Corinth, withdrew to Cassander, but Demetrius, advancing into Achaia, took Bora by storm and restored autonomy to its citizens, then, capturing Cyrus in a few days, he cast out its garrison. After this, making a campaign against Arcadian Orchomenus, he ordered the garrison commander, Strombicus, to surrender the city. When he paid no attention to the orders, but even poured much abuse upon him from the wall in an insulting manner, the king brought up engines of war, overthrew the walls, and took the city by storm. As for Strombicus, who had been made garrison commander by Polyperkin, and at least eighty of the others who were hostile to him, Demetrius crucified them in front of the city, but having captured at least two thousand of the other mercenaries, he incorporated them with his own men. After the capture of this city, those who commanded the forts in the vicinity, assuming that it was impossible to escape the might of the king, surrendered the strongholds to him. In like fashion those also who guarded the cities withdrew of their own accord, since Cassander, Prepolos, and Polyperkin failed to come to their aid, but Demetrius was approaching with a great army and with overwhelming engines of war. This was the situation of Demetrius. In Italy, the people of Tarentum were waging war with the Lucanians and the Romans, and they sent envoys to Sparta asking for assistance and for Cleonymus as general. When the Lacedaemonians willingly granted them the leader whom they requested and the Tarentines sent money and ships, Cleonymus enrolled 5,000 mercenaries at Tinarum in Laconia and sailed at once to Tarentum. After collecting their other mercenaries, no less in number than those previously enrolled, he also enlisted more than 20,000 citizens as foot soldiers and 2,000 as mounted troops. He won the support also of most of the Greeks in Italy and of the tribe of the Messapians. Then, since he had a strong army under his command, the Lucanians in alarm established friendship with the Tarentines, and when the people of Metapontum did not come over to him, he persuaded the Lucanians to invade the territory of the Metapontines and, by making a simultaneous attack himself, intimidated them. Then, entering their city as a friend, he exacted more than six hundred talents of silver, and he took two hundred maidens of the best families as hostages, not so much as a guarantee of the city's faith as to satisfy his own lust. Indeed, having discarded the Spartan garb, he lived in continued luxury and made slaves of those who had trusted in him, for although he had so strong an army and such ample supplies, he did nothing worthy of Sparta. He planned to invade Sicily as if to overthrow the tyranny of Agathocles and restore their independence to the Siciliots, but postponing this campaign for the present, he sailed to Corsera, and after getting possession of the city exacted a great sum of money and installed a garrison, intending to use this place as a base and to await a chance to take part in the affairs in Greece. But soon, when envoys did come to him both from Demetrius Poliorcetes and from Cassander proposing alliances, he joined with neither of them, but when he learned that the Tarentines and some of the others were in revolt, he left an adequate garrison in Corsera, and with the rest of his army sailed at top speed to Italy in order to punish those who defied his commands. Putting into land in the district that was defended by the barbarians, he took the city, sold its people into slavery, and plundered the countryside. He likewise took by siege the city called Triopium, capturing about 3,000 prisoners. But at this very time the barbarians throughout the region came together and attacked his camp by night, and in the battle that took place they slew more than 200 of Cleonymus' men and made prisoners about a thousand. A storm rising at the time of the battle destroyed twenty of the ships that lay at anchor near his encampment. Having met with two such disasters, Cleonymus sailed away to Corsera with his army. When this year had passed, Nicocles was archon in Athens, and in Rome Marcus Livius and Marcus Emilius received the consulship. While these held office, Cassander, the king of the Macedonians, on seeing that the power of the Greeks was increasing and that the whole war was directed against Macedonia, became much alarmed about the future. He therefore sent envoys into Asia to Antigonus, asking him to come to terms with him. 
but when Antigonus replied that he recognized only one basis for a settlement, Cassander's surrender of whatever he possessed, Cassander was alarmed and summoned Lysimachus from Thrace to take concerted action in regard to their highest interests, for it was his invariable custom when facing the most alarming situations to call on Lysimachus for assistance, both because of his personal character and because his kingdom lay next to Macedonia. When these kings had taken counsel together about their common interests, they sent envoys to Ptolemy, the king of Egypt, and to Seleucus, who was ruler of the upper satrapies, revealing the arrogance of Antigonus' answer and showing that the danger arising from the war was common to all. For they said, if Antigonus should gain control of Macedonia, he would at once take their kingdoms from the others also, indeed he had given proof many times that he was grasping and regarded any command as a possession not to be shared. It would therefore, they said, be advantageous for all to make plans in common and jointly undertake a war against Antigonus. Now Ptolemy and Seleucus, believing that the statements were true, eagerly agreed and arranged with Cassander to assist one another with strong forces. Cassander, however, thought it best not to await the attack of his enemies but to get the start of them by opening the campaign himself and seizing what he could use to advantage. Therefore Cassander gave to Lysimachus a part of his army and sent with Epipolos as general, while he himself moved with the rest of the army into Thessaly to carry on the war with Demetrius and the Greeks. Lysimachus with his army crossed from Europe to Asia, and since the inhabitants of Lampsicus and Perium came over to him willingly, he left them free, but when he took Sygeum by force, he installed a garrison there. Next, giving his general Prepolos six thousand foot soldiers and a thousand horse, he sent him to win over the cities throughout Aeolis and Ionia. As for himself, he first attempted to invest Abydus and set about preparing missiles and engines and the other equipment, but when there arrived by sea to assist the besieged a large body of soldiers sent by Demetrius, a force sufficient to secure the safety of the city, he gave up this attempt and won over Hellespontine Phrygia, and also laid siege to the city of Sinada, which possessed a great royal treasure. It was at this very time that he even persuaded Docimus, the general of Antigonus, to make common cause with him, and by his aid he took Sonata and also some of the strongholds that held the royal wealth. Prepolos, the general who had been sent by Lysimachus to Iolis and Ionia, mastered Adramidium as he passed by, and then, laying siege to Ephesus and frightening its inhabitants, he took the city. The hundred Rhodian hostages whom he found there he sent back to their native land, and he left the Ephesians free but burned all the ships in the harbor, since the enemy controlled the sea and the whole outcome of the war was uncertain. After this, he secured the adherence of the people of Teos and of Colophon, but since reinforcements came by sea to Erythri and Clazomene, he could not capture these cities, however, he plundered their territory and then set out for Sardis. There, by persuading Antigonus General Phoenix to desert the king, he gained control of the city except the Acropolis, for Philip, one of the friends of Antigonus, who was guarding the citadel, held firm his loyalty toward the man who had placed trust in him. The affairs of Lysimachus were in this position. Antigonus, who had made preparations to celebrate great games and a festival in Antigonia, had collected from all sides the most famous athletes and artists to compete for great prizes and fees. But when he heard of the crossing of Lysimachus and the desertion of his own generals, he abandoned the games but distributed to the athletes and artists not less than two hundred talents as compensation. He himself taking his army set out from Syria and made a rapid march against the enemy. Arriving at Tarsus in Cilicia, he paid the army for three months from the money he had brought down from Syinda. Apart from this fund, he was carrying three thousand talents with the army in order that he might have this provision whenever he had need of money. Then, crossing the Taurus range, he marched toward Cappadocia, and, advancing upon those who had deserted him in Upper Phrygia and Lycania, he restored them again to the former alliance. At this very time Lysimachus, on hearing of the presence of the enemy, held a council considering how he ought to meet the approaching dangers. They decided not to join in battle until Seleucus should come down from the upper satrapies, but to occupy strong positions and, after making their encampment safe with palisade and ditch, to await the onslaught of the enemy. They therefore carried out their decision with vigor, but Antigonus, when he came near the enemy, drew up his army and challenged them to battle. When no one dared to issue forth, he himself occupied certain places through which it was necessary that the provisions of his opponents should be transported, and Lysimachus, fearing that if their food supply should be cut off, they would then be at the mercy of the enemy, broke camp at night, made a forced march of four hundred stades, and camped near Dorylium, for the stronghold had an ample store of grain and other supplies, 
and a river ran by it that could give protection to those who camped beside it. Pitching camp, they strengthened their encampment with a deep ditch and a triple stockade. When Antigonus learned of the departure of the enemy he at once pursued them, and, after he had approached their encampment, since they did not come out for battle, he began to surround their camp with a trench, and he sent for catapults and missiles, intending to storm it. When shots were exchanged about the excavation and Lysimachus' men tried to drive away with missiles those who were working, in every case Antigonus had the better of it. Then as time passed and the work was already nearing completion, since food was growing scarce for the besieged, Lysimachus, after waiting for a stormy night, set out from the camp and departed through the higher land to go into winter quarters. But when at daybreak Antigonus saw the departure of the enemy, he himself marched parallel with them through the plains. Great rainstorms occurred, with the result that, as the country had deep soil and became very muddy, he lost a considerable number of his pack animals and a few of his men, and in general the whole army was in serious difficulty. Therefore the king, both because he wished to restore his soldiers after their sufferings and because he saw that the winter season was at hand, gave up the pursuit, and selecting the places best suited for wintering, he divided his army into sections. But when he learned that Seleucus was coming down from the upper satrapies with a great force, he sent some of his friends into Greece to Demetrius, bidding him come to him with his army as soon as possible, for, since all the kings had united against him, he was taking every precaution not to be forced to decide the whole war in battle before the army in Europe came to join him. Similarly Lysimachus also divided his army in order to go into winter quarters in the plain called that of Salonia. He obtained ample supplies from Heraclea, having made a marriage alliance with the Heracleotes, for he had married Amestris, the daughter of Oxyarts and niece of King Darius. She had been wife of Craterus, given him by Alexander, and at the time in question was ruler of the city. Such was the situation in Asia. In Greece Demetrius, who was tarrying in Athens, was eager to be initiated and to participate in the mysteries at Eleusis. Since it was a considerable time before the legally established day on which the Athenians were accustomed to celebrate the mysteries, he persuaded the people, because of his benefactions, to change the custom of their fathers. And so, giving himself over unarmed to the priests, he was initiated before the regular day and departed from Athens. And first he gathered together his fleet and his land army in Chalcis of Euboea, then, learning that Cassander had already occupied the passes in advance, he gave up the attempt to advance into Thessaly by land, but sailed along the coast with the army into the port of Larissa. Disembarking the army, he captured the city at once, and taking the Acropolis, he imprisoned the garrison and put them under guard, but he restored their autonomy to the people of Larissa. Thereafter he won over Antron's and Telium, and when Cassander would have transported the people of Diam and Archomenus into Thebes, he prevented the transplanting of the cities. But when Cassander saw that Demetrius' undertakings were prospering, he first protected Ferry and Thebes with stronger garrisons, and then, after collecting his whole army into one place, he encamped over against Demetrius. He had in all 29,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 horsemen. Demetrius was followed by 1,500 horsemen, not less than 8,000 Macedonian foot soldiers, mercenaries to the number of 15,000, 25,000 from the cities throughout Greece, and at least 8,000 of the light armed troops and of the freebooters of all sorts, such as gather where there is fighting and plundering, so that there were in all about 56,000 foot soldiers. For many days, the camps were pitched opposite each other, and the battle lines were drawn up on both sides, but neither came forward into battle since each was awaiting the decision of the whole matter that would take place in Asia. Demetrius, however, when the people of Ferry called upon him, entering their city with part of his army and taking the citadel, dismissed the soldiers of Cassander on terms and restored their liberty to the people of Ferry. While affairs in Thessaly were in this state, there came to Demetrius the messengers sent by Antigonus, accurately detailing the orders of his father and bidding him take his army across into Asia as swiftly as possible. Since he regarded obedience to his father's orders as obligatory, the king came to terms with Cassander, making the condition that the agreements should be valid only if they were acceptable to his father, for although he very well knew that his father would not accept them since he had definitely made up his mind to bring an end by force of arms the war which had set in, yet Demetrius wished to make his withdrawal from Greece appear respectable and not like a flight. Indeed, it was written among other conditions in the agreement that the Greek cities were to be free, not only those of Greece, but also those of Asia. 
Then Demetrius, after preparing ships for the transportation of the soldiers and the equipment, set sail with his whole fleet and, going through the islands, put in at Ephesus. Disembarking his army and camping near the walls, he forced the city to return to its former status, then he dismissed on terms the garrison that had been introduced by Prepolos, the general of Lysimachus, and after stationing his own garrison on the Acropolis, he went on to the Hellespont. He also recovered Lampsicus and Perium, likewise some of the other cities that had changed sides, and when he arrived at the entrance of the Pontus, he constructed a camp beside the shrine of the Chalcedonians and left to guard the region 3,000 foot soldiers and 30 warships. Then he sent the rest of the army into winter quarters, dividing it among the cities. At about this time Mithridates, who was subject to Antigonus but appeared to be shifting his allegiance to Cassander, was slain at Seus in Mysia after having ruled that city in Merlia for thirty-five years, and Mithridates, inheriting the kingdom, added many new subjects and was king of Cappadocia and Paphlagonia for thirty-six years. In these same days Cassander, after the departure of Demetrius, took possession of the cities of Thessaly and sent Pleistarchus with an army into Asia to aid Lysimachus. Those sent with him were twelve thousand foot soldiers and five hundred horsemen. But when Pleistarchus came to the entrance of the Pontus, he found that the region had already been taken over by the enemy and, abandoning the crossing, he turned aside to Odessus, which lies between Apollonia and Calantia, directly opposite to Heraclea on the opposite shore, where a part of the army of Lysimachus was quartered. Since he did not have ships enough for transporting his soldiers, he divided his army into three contingents. Now the first force sent out came safe to Heraclea, but the second was captured by the guard ships at the entrance to the Pontus. When Plistarchus himself set sail with the third group, so great a tempest rose that most of the vessels and the men on them were lost, and indeed the large warship that carried the general sank, and of the not less than five hundred men who sailed in her, only thirty-three were saved. Among these was Plistarchus who, holding to a piece of wreckage, was cast ashore half dead. He was carried to Heraclea and after recovering from the misfortune went to Lysimachus at winter quarters, having lost the larger part of his army. During these same days King Ptolemy, setting out from Egypt with an army of considerable size, subjugated all the cities of Coel Syria, but while he was besieging Sidon certain men came to him with the false report that a battle had taken place between the kings in which Lysimachus and Seleucus had been defeated, that they had withdrawn to Heraclea, and that Antigonus, after winning the victory, was advancing with an army against Syria. Consequently, Ptolemy, deceived by them and believing that their report was true, made a four-month's truce with the Sidonians, secured with garrisons the cities that he had captured, and went back to Egypt with his army. At the same time as this was taking place, some of the soldiers of Lysimachus, having left their winter quarters as deserters, went over to Antigonus, namely 2,000 Otariidae and about 800 Lycians and Pamphylians. Now Antigonus, receiving these men in kindly fashion, not only gave them the pay which they said was due them from Lysimachus, but also honored them with gifts. At this time Seleucus also arrived, having crossed over from the upper satrapies into Cappadocia with a large army, and after making huts for the soldiers he went into winter quarters nearby. He had foot soldiers to the number of about 20,000, about 12,000 horsemen including his mounted archers, 480 elephants, and more than a hundred scythe chariots. In this way, then, the forces of the kings were being gathered together, since they all had determined to decide the war by force of arms during the coming summer. But, as we proposed in the beginning, we shall make the war that these kings waged against each other for supreme rule the beginning of the following book. End of Book 20